Good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, my pleasure to call to order the January 20th, 2022, regular meeting of the Thompson Nicola Regional District Board of Directors. We have a public hearing and, <clears throat> excuse me, today's public hearing is convened under the provisions of the Local Government Act of British Columbia to hear submissions relative to uh, proposed bylaws. We have encouraged written submissions to this hearing. And given that we are conducting this public hearing electronically, the meeting is organized so that we may also accept live video submissions. This is the public's opportunity to make representations to the board. All persons who believe that their interest in property is affected by the proposed bylaws shall be given a reasonable opportunity to be heard respecting the bylaws in the, uh, sorry, respecting matters in the proposed bylaws. I would ask those members of the public who wish to speak to commence your address to this board by clearly stating your name. The board will not debate the matters of a proposed bylaw with individual citizens, but members of the board may ask questions of you following your presentation. The main function of this public hearing is to listen to your views. No one will be or should feel discouraged or prevented from making their views heard. Bylaw 2761 amends zoning bylaw 2400 by rezoning 3903 Monty Lake Road from C1 retail commercial to R1 residential single and duplex zone to enable primary residential use and the rebuilding of a home lost to wildfire. Madam Corporate Officer, are there any written submissions? There are no written submissions, Chair. Thank you. Are there any live video submissions? Chair, we, um, we've been in touch with the, uh, one of the applicants, Mr. Smith, um, and he has advised that he would like to address the board via Zoom, but I just wanna take a moment and see if he's been able to get in. Thank you, Chair. I don't. Um, Hi, can everybody hear me now? Mr. Smith? Yes. Great, thank you. Sorry, it's first time using this. I had no idea how to work it. <laughs> uh, I don't have anything really to uh, address anybody about um, other than, well, we, we're hoping for an approval, obviously, because uh, we need somewhere to build a house. Does anyone have questions uh, for our presenter? I'm, I'm not seeing any, so <laughs> it might be a smooth, uh, a smooth one for you today. Uh, <clears throat> are there any further representations with respect to bylaw 2761? The second time, are there any further representations uh, for uh, with respect to bylaw 2761. 
And for the final time, are there any further representations with respect to bylaw 2761? I'm hearing none. There being no further speakers, I declare this public hearing closed. Thank you for your input and thank you, Mr. Smith. Thank you. <clears throat> that takes us to chair's announcements. And I am happy to welcome you to, uh, to today's meeting. The TNRD acknowledges that we connect with many First Nations communities across our vast regional district. And today we're located on the Tecumlep Shequepmik territory, situated within the unceded ancestral lands of the Shequepmik Nation. Uh, the TNRD appreciates the partnership we have with Tecumlep Shequepmik and respect the territory and land on which we gather today. I hope to uh, wish a belated Happy New Year to everyone. And I hope you had an enjoyable holiday. It was great to see some sunshine this week. And it seems to have gone, but I'm assured that it'll be returning shortly. And uh, I hope grand, the groundhog doesn't see his shadow. It would be nice to have an early spring. Uh, I wish to extend a hearty welcome to alternate director Walsh, who is uh, with us via Zoom today. And also a hearty welcome to our new recording secretary, Olivia, Olivia who is with us this afternoon. Nice to see you here, Olivia. Welcome aboard. The uh, Thompson Nicola Regional Library is partnering with the BC Lung Association to lend radon detectors. Uh, 20 detectors will be available to TNRD residents beginning the 1st of February. And radon is the number one cause of lung cancer in non-smokers with one in six homes apparently in Western Canada experiencing high levels. If you're interested, please visit the library's website for more details. We have upcoming meetings and events. On the 3rd of February, there's a meeting of the audit committee. On the 3rd of February, there's a regular board meeting. On February 24th, there will be a regular board meeting. And on the 25th, a meeting of the Committee of the Whole. Today in your blue folders, you will find any mail personally addressed to you. Are there any additions to or deletions from the agenda? I see none. Uh, that takes us to the minutes. There's a recommendation. So I'll move. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed, if any? Carried. Uh, with respect to bylaws from public hearings, we have zoning amendment bylaw 2761 2022 3903 Marty Lake Road, Marty Lake, BC. There's a recommendation that the public hearing input and the report be considered, and if no amendments are proposed, that zoning amendment bylaw 2761 20, uh, 2021 be read a third time. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Is anyone opposed? That's carried. That brings us to delegations. And we have a couple of, uh, of presenters who are waiting patiently. First, we have MLA Peter Millibar for Kamloops North Thompson. Next, we have uh, MLA Jackie, Jackie Taggart from <laughs> Fraser Nicola. Um, I uh, I'm advised that MLA Todd Stone was called away and is not going to be available to speak to us this afternoon. So uh, um, MLA Millibar, would you like to take over? Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Gillis. I'd suggest maybe uh, we, we should probably start with MLA Taggart. There's been a whole lot more going on in her uh, her area of the regional district in her uh, riding than, than uh, in the North Thompson, thankfully. And so probably more timely to start off with her. Okay, Jackie. Thank you so much, um, Chair Gillis. And it's a pleasure to be here to present to the board today. Um, uh, first off, I'd like to start by um, sharing apologies from MLA Todd Stone. He's sorry he can't be with us today. And I'd like to start by saying it's an understatement to say I don't know where to start. Uh, 2021, what a year it's been. 
heat dome, fires, floods, highway closures, COVID, and now we're into recovery. Um, the incredible thing as we think about all of the uh, emergency situations that we faced is the um, heroes at our local level. And some of those are sitting at your table. Um, the people who step up in times of emergency and advocate and be there for people who need them. I'd like to acknowledge all of you and your staff because it's been an incredible year. And people are COVID weary, they're out of sorts. And then to be facing the kinds of things that we saw this year, it's been, um, to, say, to say it's been an incredible year is an understatement. Um, so as the MLA for uh, Fraser Nicola, I've been uh, working with um, the village of Lytton, uh, the citizens of Lytton and area, uh, looking at the fire zones, um, special mention to Steve Rice and the advocacy during fire and flood. Um, Highway 8, I had the opportunity to take a drive with a constituent. Um, I have to say it was one of the most um, hair-raising drives I've ever had. Um, to go down and talk to people who were, who were isolated and staying with their animals because uh, they just had gotten them back early in the fall and here they were into floods. Um, the devastation throughout my riding, I call it the epicenter of every disaster. Um, but you know, as, as much as it is so difficult for everybody, uh, there has been some real good, uh, feel good stories of people helping each other. And uh, we are gonna work hard. Um, I am there for anyone who needs assistance. My office is there for anyone who finds themselves not knowing where to turn or how to take down barriers. And uh, that, is our, that is our focus right now. We wanna work with the TNRD, we wanna work with local governments, and we wanna advocate and make sure that we're not forgot, forgotten in the big picture across British Columbia. Uh, the other thing I wanna talk about is the significance of the road closures that we've seen. Um, we have many people throughout our region and throughout the TNRD who were cut off, who were isolated, and I have to say that um, I am so impressed with road building. With the uh, return of the uh, Coquihalla, uh, the, the opening of the Coquihalla, I'm looking forward to um, the opening of the Fraser Canyon, um, hopefully by the end of this month. We're working hard on Highway 8, as Steve is well aware, and um, some of the devastation is unbelievable working hard to get people onto their properties that have been cut off and are isolated and um, ensuring that Highway 99 stays open so that we have access to the lower mainland. We've heard some horrendous stories of people who have had to give up um, medical appointments, um, all kinds of things because we have been cut off. And you realize the importance of these corridors and the supply chains. Uh, besides disasters, um, we had a significant um, fall session. And I think many of us have had conversations about uh, the new forestry bill and what the impact will be uh, to people in our areas. Um, we expect to see mill closures. We expect to see job losses. And we will continue to advocate on behalf of people in our region uh, to make sure that we try very hard to minimize that. The uh, Freedom of Information Bill came forward this fall. Todd Stone put forward an amendment to that bill asking for proactive disclosure um, during emergencies and wildfires. Because what we're hearing from people is that when they're asking for information about what happened during the emergency, they're being directed to FOI. And as we know, uh, they've put a charge on every 
FOI request and for citizens who are simply looking for information. This is a barrier and a very confusing process for them. And we were extremely disappointed that the government would not look at an amendment that would um, encourage people and allow them to get information that is public information. We of course have a boundary review coming up in the next uh, 12 to 18 months. And I think all of you around the table know what that boundary review uh, process is. Um, we have real concern in regards to um, the changes that might be um, recommended in regards to boundaries for ridings. And I think that the emergency processes we went through this year and have in the last five years indicate that although we might have small populations, we have incredibly big areas to represent. And it is absolutely essential that people have access to their MLAs. So please watch for that and think about how it will affect your citizens. Um, just coming up, we have emergency management review and legislation that's um, been promised through um, Minister Farnworth's office. And so I think a lot of us around this table and, and in this area um, have a lot of experience to share on what worked and what didn't work and where we think some changes should be. And um, the last thing I just wanna say is that I know all of us are concerned about preparation for spring freshet. Um, we're seeing recovery being slow. Um, and we know that with the snow we've received this, this uh, winter, um, we may be challenged again in the freshet. So um, we're there, we're here to serve you and to serve our citizens and, um, and to be that voice in Victoria. So I wanna thank all, all of you for the help and the assistance that you've given everyone in the region and also um, indicate that as the MLA for Fraser Nicola, if there, are, if there is anything that we can do to assist, we're as close as an email or a telephone. So uh, happy new year to all of you. I know many of our, our people are in difficult positions. We must never forget that. And um, our job is to get our people home. Thank you. Thanks, MLA Taggart. Uh, does anyone have a question for MLA Taggart? Director Rice. Yes, thank you, Chair, and thank you, uh, MLA Taggart. Uh, thanks, Jackie. I appreciate uh, the upgrade. And, and on the last thing on the fresh yet, uh, um, on my flyover, Sean Clough, who's sort of the lead on uh, MOTI's end of the project here, um, he was very, um, clear that the, the debris buildup on the cold water is so significant. And once that combines with the uh, debris in the Nicola River and comes downstream, uh, building any bridges on the recovery efforts on the highway is not even being considered until after the spring freshet. So there is a very real uh, possibility that, you know, we have not seen the last of our troubles here on uh, highway number eight. So I, I'm glad that MLI Taggart brought that up and I thank her for that. The other thing I would like to bring up for, uh, since she's uh, offered her help and uh, maybe uh, MLA Millibar could also bring this to Victoria because uh, Keep in mind that people, at least two of the people that I know of, and there may be more, have not only lost their homes, they've lost their land, meaning their land is now a river. So their title and their property description, their legal uh, outlines the river and maybe some shoreline. So they can never rebuild there again. These people have gone here to retire. This is where they worked their whole life to get to. And now they, do, they literally can't go back. So my ask would be at this point, they will still wanna live in and around Spence's Bridge, they can't find any place. So my ask that we, as an exceptional, as this is extraordinary circumstance, we never visited before, that the ALC strongly consider letting like myself, who has a nice little parcel across the highway, not sell it, but even just donate it to these folks so they don't have to live outside of their dream come true, if you will, their retirement place and stuff. There's also a couple other farms around here, carving off 
two or three or five acres would be a great solution to a huge problem for something that these guys worked their entire lives to get and was taken away in the raging rivers of uh, November 15th. So that's one thing I would like to take to Victoria to approach the Agricultural Land Commission and maybe look at carving out exception for this situation for these people that no longer have a home to go to. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thanks, Director Rice. Are there any other questions for MLA Taggart? I don't see any hands up. So thank you ever so much for your presentation, MLA Taggart and uh, MLA Millibar. We'll be pleased to hear from you now after you having deferred to, uh, to uh, MLA Taggart. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And it's always wise to, uh, to pass it over to Jackie first because she, uh, she's got a mean left jab as the government's finding out when it comes to things around Lytton and, and Merritt and, and other areas within her riding. So um, thanks everyone uh, for creating the time for us. It's, it's always nice to get in and, and uh, present in front of you as we head into a, a new legislative session. I will be back in Victoria the first week of, of February and um, we're not 100% sure what the legislator, legislature, legislature will look like in terms of seating and, and hybrid or not. Uh, those details are still being worked out uh, with myself and the other house leaders, but uh, uh, either way we are for sure going back and, and the budget will be presented on February 22nd. And so, um, you know, a few things that we'll be keeping an eye out for is, is issues around um, healthcare and, and some of the spending and, and what types of lifts and spending in, in, in particular interior health may be seeing. Uh, certainly I think uh, most people on this screen are, are well aware of the, of the challenges we're facing with, with healthcare and the latest announcement this week um, in terms of IHA is, has been uh, quite concerning for a lot of communities uh, in terms of what we're seeing with either um, uh, the beds in Clearwater being shut down for, for four weeks or so, uh, barrier and the nursing situation there, Ashcroft reduced hours. Uh, you name it across the board and, and it creates further problems because as the camels directors know, uh, Royal Inland's already at capacity. So closing things down to push more into to Royal Inland um, is not a, an optimum solution either uh, for, for people. And so uh, we've all been uh, trying to get from the government um, what the plan is long-term for staffing um, in the area. And um, we keep being told uh, from the premier and, and the health minister, they have a plan. Uh, but they won't tell us what the plan is and they won't tell us when the plan will be uh, released. So we'll continue to, to work on that because we do recognize COVID, of course, is playing a big part uh, currently with the Omicron uh, with some of these issues. But uh, again, as we all know, there's been long-standing issues that um, uh, go back and pre-COVID and, and we need to make sure as we start to advance out of COVID um, that we're not seeing a, a further erosion of those health services uh, long-term uh, in the community. Uh, in terms of uh, some other issues that we'll be keeping an eye on, obviously because of the budget, we'll be keeping a close eye on, on what type of uh, infrastructure and support programs uh, are maintained and, and spending levels of, of various programming uh, is there for communities to, to access and tap into as per usual. Uh, that's because of the backdrop of all of the, the repair and disaster uh, relief that needs to happen. Uh, the government's assured that that will happen and it should happen. Uh, but it won't come at the expense of those other programs. So we'll be keeping a close eye to make sure that is indeed actually happening and that uh, moving forward, we won't see an erosion of some of those, uh, some of those things like we saw in previous years when the, the uh, rural, uh, small rural community grant uh, disappeared and things of that nature. Um, when Jackie touched on the FOI, um, you know, it's just something to, to keep in mind as your communities go through some of these challenges. Um, it is very critical, and that's why it was disappointing that the, the amendment around uh, proactive disclosure on fire uh, information uh, was not adopted by the government. Uh, in 2017, the Elephant Hill fire and, and other fires, uh, residents spent years and, and, and tons of legal wrangling to try to get something as basic as, as government fire logs to find out what was actually happening in a fire. Um, and it's very stressful at the best of times, let alone having to then fight for that type of information. Um, while we were getting ready to bring forward the amendment, we actually had filed uh, FOIs uh, for the White Rock Lake wildfire. Um, and uh, the response we got back was no records found. 
So when we were looking for logbooks and, and actioning logbooks and, and resourcing logbooks to try to match up with timelines of what the government said was being resourced to the fire versus what was actually happening, the response we got back on an FOI written by people that write these on a regular basis was no records found. And so that's why proactive disclosure is so critically important because uh, for the average homeowner to try to figure out how to word something exactly right to fit the exact right phrase and terminology within government uh, bodies would be next to impossible if people that are ingrained in government uh, operations themselves are coming up with a slightly wrong wording. Imagine what a homeowner is going to come up with in terms of what they think something should be called versus what a, a government agency would call that, that document. So it is critically important, I think, that we keep pressing to try to get that proactive disclosure around uh, disasters uh, because we need to learn properly from them what, what actually did work well and what didn't work well, not, not the back and forth between communities and, and electeds and, and uh, regional boards and things of that nature. And then the last piece I'll just maybe touch on as well and then and take any questions is um, uh, just a little bit further depth to, to what Jackie was saying about the Boundary Commission. So the Electoral Boundary Commission is a statutory uh, commission that, that uh, happens every eight years in the province. And so this is the year that it's supposed to happen. And they review the size of ridings, how many MLAs, uh, the distribution of voters within those ridings. Um, previously, there was, I think it was 14 or 15 ridings were red circled, basically the interior of the north and the, and the Kootenays. And they didn't say that these boundaries have to be these boundaries. They just said within that geographic area, there had to be those 14 or 15 ridings, um, regardless of population. And then the rest can be in the lower mainland and on Vancouver Island and things of that nature. Um, that has actually been stripped out of uh, the legislation now by the government. So that protection of those ridings or that number of ridings no longer exists. And in addition, they've also tasked and given the Electoral Boundary Commission the ability to add up to six more seats in the province. So to go from 87 seats to 93 seats. And I think we can all recognize that likely those six seats should wind up in the lower mainland based on population growth, maybe one in the Okanagan, uh, but for sure five. But the problem is there's as many as six or seven of those 15 seats could disappear as well. And so you would literally have ridings in the north uh, that take up a quarter of the geography of British Columbia in one riding. Um, Kamloops would not see huge change, let's face it, because of the, the population based with Kamloops north and south. You know, our boundaries would move a bit, but Fraser Nicola could disappear. And if not Fraser Nicola, uh, then the Chicolton riding could disappear. Um, and so, you know, out of the, out of, uh, you know, the riding that would represent Quinnell or then Williams Lake or then Jackie's riding, probably at least one of those three would disappear. And so it starts to, when you think of fires, when you think of floods, when you think of those types of, of responses and trying to get a uh, government uh, response or, or an MLA to be able to help support, uh, it gets to be very critical. So I would just encourage people, um, when the, when the commission goes out and starts seeking comment, uh, likely it would be over Zoom because of COVID, uh, but there's a retired uh, Chief Justice on it, there's the, the head of Elections BC, and then there's a, a member of the public at large that's been appointed. So it's just a three-person panel. I would encourage everybody to make, uh, make your feelings known as to where, where you feel on this, uh, good or bad, uh, but if you don't engage on one side or the other, uh, they'll take your silence as, as uh, however they may want to interpret it. So it really is an important process, uh, especially because those uh, protection of that geography and number of seats has been removed. And so, um, as I say, the, the, the next step in it is after they make their decision, then they, in a nonpartisan way, decide where the lines on a map go. And, that, and we're totally fine with that. We get that. And that should not be a political interference exercise at all. But uh, the sheer number um, within a certain geography should, in my opinion, not, not be severely changed, um, or we're going to have, um, you know, massive, massive ridings that deal with a, a pretty wide range of, of natural disasters on a regular basis to try to try to service. So I'll leave it at that and, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks very much, uh, MLA Millibar. There's a number of people who have questions for you, starting with Director Blackwell. Never tell if you're going to go first or not. Thank you, Mr. Chair uh, and MLA Millibar, uh, for your advocacy on all these points, and and thank you, Jackie, for your advocacy 
on Spence's bridge goes definitely noticed here. Um, specific to the closures of hospital um, nursing shortage and that sort of thing through the North Thompson, I've made uh, director slash mayor Stamer aware of this, but I haven't for any of the EA directors. But the intention, if you are sent to Clearwater, need to be admitted, um, you will be transferred at this point to 100 mile house um which is all fine and dandy in some senses if you know we're in crisis my concern at this point is um being aware that getting people once they're discharged back from 100 mile house especially low-income single people and uh, and those without family supports is going to be incredibly difficult because there is no bus no taxi no anything along those lines so that's a heads up to the uh the ea directors and the mayors of the north thompson that you may want to encourage their members to just go or their, their citizens to go just straight to Kamloops and check themselves in there and that sucks and, and I, I would love your attention on that uh, if it does come to that point where we're going to need to find a solution to that for uh, our residents thanks yeah, thanks for that and, and that's that's new news to me as well that unfortunately IHA doesn't uh, give me much heads up either these days and and it seems to be an ever-changing uh, goalpost over the last two days as 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 mayors have rightly reacted uh, around the region as to uh, what's happening in their community so one would have hoped this would have been slightly better thought out and frankly uh, trying to get over the 24 to 100 mile I'm assuming that's the route they want people to take in the middle of January um, uh, starts to really bring a whole lot of other level of questions in. So, thank you, Director Christian. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you to MLA Millibar. Um, I've been working with the uh, BC Urban Mayors Caucus for about the last 18 months on the issue of complex care. And uh, this morning, uh, the government, through Minister Malcolmson, announced uh, four pilot sites, two in Vancouver, one in Surrey, and one in Abbotsford uh, to take up this cause. I was wondering if you might be able to lobby on behalf of the city of Kamloops, and in fact, the entire region, uh, for uh, a second look at a complex care facility uh, here in Kamloops. It's primarily to uh, meet the needs of individuals which have chronic untreated mental illness, uh, complicated by addiction and now further complicated by acquired brain injury. We estimate that there's about 30 such individuals on the streets of Kamloops uh, and they actually are walking the streets of Kamloops, probably come from the entire region, but in and of themselves, they are creating a great deal of chaos, both for business, for customers, and most importantly, uh, their health needs are not being met by the, the current uh, uh, housing continuum. So uh, any uh, help that you might be able to provide uh, in terms of lobbying on behalf of uh, Camels would be appreciated. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Director Christian. And certainly um, that's something that, again, as we get into the budget in February, we'll be keeping a close eye on and, and having those discussions with government. I noticed today the announcement was with year-end money and they indicated stay tuned for the budget and in fact they plan on on having the funding for a complex care channel channel through health authorities uh, why that's a concern for me is when we go to uh, the minister to ask where money for an extra car 40 program in gamos is uh, she refers you back to the health authority when you ask for just about anything, it gets referred back to the health authority. So uh, the worry I have is that if, it, if it's um, health authority based, uh, you know, again, we're, we're back into that uh, battle of the two K towns to see uh, where complex care is going to land. So uh, it's definitely something we'll be uh, keeping an eye out much like a foundry for youth as well. Um, you know, that we've been banging our head against the wall for those types of programs uh, as well. So we'll, we'll definitely keep an eye out for that and lobby for it. Thank you. I have Director Stamer and Director Smith, and I think that will be the end of the questions because we have a very full agenda to move on with. So, Director Stamer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks, uh, MLA Millibar. A couple of questions, Pete. Uh, first, thanks for the heads up the other day on the, uh, on the inf infomercial that you were participating in because I didn't get that invitation. So thank you for at least giving me the heads up of what was coming down the pipe. A uh, couple of questions, uh, timelines on the review of community forest tab rates. 
uh, with the public consultation and reviews. Can you give us a quick little update if you have any information on that? And secondly, uh, on the BC wildfire response, thank you for that information. But those records that uh, they find, they, they believe do not exist, uh, those daily logs, I believe, would be uh, something that if they were destroyed, um, can we sue on that? Because, I mean, I would think that, you know, those actions or reactions are covered by civil and criminal law, and we know that they exist. And if they aren't allowing us to see it, I'm sure if we were going to be suing them, we'd be seeing it. So what's the what's the criteria on that? Uh, thanks. So uh, first thing on the forestry, nothing new that I'm aware of to report there. It's it's always a uh, it seems to be a pretty evolving file where these days we just saw some announcements with old growth deferrals uh, with some First Nations, but many more to uh, still have those discussions, including this, including the SIMP. Um, in terms of the logs, uh, part of the reason we we put in the FOI as quickly as we did, we've heard conflicting reports that as a matter of practice, things are destroyed at the end of a fire season. Um, and uh, that's just their, their process and their procedure. Uh, we're not 100% sure if that actually is what happens or not and how long they keep them for or not. Um, and I'm certainly not a lawyer, nor do I play one on TV. So I couldn't tell you what your, uh, what your legal ability would be in terms of uh, suing to access. But again, that's just, that's what made us, um, you know, between conversations Jackie, myself, and Todd, and others had around this uh, with the FOI bill, we were we were trying to figure out how best to shine a light on some of the flaws, and we realized uh, bringing forward a, an amendment to try to get that proactive disclosure on something as critical as as this type of information. If you're trying to rebuild, and your insurance company is giving you two years, it's you know you, you don't have time to keep waiting and refiling FOIs. You need the information, and you need to get moving forward. So. Um, you know, again, we're going to keep pressing and pushing on that, and any support uh, is welcome. Thank you, Director Smith. Um, thank you. I'm sorry, I was a little slow on the draw, um, Emily Taggart. <laughs> um, I uh, I do have a question, um, just with regard to uh, the. Um, consideration of allow, alignment and boundaries and all of that sort of thing. I'm only curious about whether there's um, consideration of aligning them uh, between political representation um, and um, school board uh, representation. Because um, that's just, I'm just curious because I, I always find that we often get representation for different facets from different places and it can be confusing uh, for some people and um, lucky for um, MLA Stone and MLA um, Millibar that I most often talk to Jackie um, but I do bug them on occasion too um, and if it means that uh, I'm going to have somebody in my corner to help I always can count on the three of you and I do appreciate that so um, thank you for that but I just yeah I really had a question about if there's ever consideration to um, aligning those um, boundaries with, with school representation as well. Well, um, I can tell you that I have three different, four different school boards in my riding, three different regional districts, um, over 30 First Nations. Um, so I have not heard discussion around uh, aligning it with other boundaries. Um, we don't seem to be able to do that in British Columbia. And so I haven't heard that discussion, but there is criteria that they use. And, um, but we have the opportunity to influence and to advocate to ensure that our citizens have access and reasonable access to their MLAs. Peter, do you yep. have anything? Uh, no, just to uh, thank Director Smith for Logan's Lakes Hospitality a couple of weeks ago because I won our, our little uh, four or five person ice fishing der turn uh, derby there and, and uh, apparently Twitter was not as uh, kind to me later that evening, but thank you to Mayor Smith for the, uh, the well, warm welcome in Logan Lake. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> okay, uh, I certainly wish to thank both of you, the board wishes to thank both of you for appearing uh, before us today. And I want to say that if anybody else has questions for either of these MLAs or MLA Stone, my experience has been that they're all three make themselves very, very accessible. There should be uh, no difficulty in getting in touch with them through their offices. Thanks once again. 
MLA Millibar, MLA Taggart, uh, always good to see you. That brings us to our next delegation, which is patiently waiting, which is uh, Dan Buffett, the CAO of the Habitat Conservation Trust Foundation, and also Steve Kazuki, I understand, uh, who is the executive, executive director of the Forest Enhancement Society of BC. They're gonna give us an update on conservation and forest enhancement projects happening throughout the TNRD. So please go ahead, gentlemen. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for having us. If Dan, oh, he's just being admitted now. Um, and if you could give him the ability to share his screen with you, that would be fabulous. Uh, Dan, you're, you're still muted. Well, thank you everybody for, for having us while Dan gets uh, online here. Uh, we're delighted to present to you. Uh, just wanted to let you know right off the bat, we're, we're not asking anything from you. We just wanna share some, some stories about our programs and the great work that's going on uh, around in your local areas. Are you on, Dan? Great, thank, thank, you. thank you, Steve, yes. Well, good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. As Steve mentioned, it's, it's really about, uh, you know, the presentation from both Steve and I to talk about as funding organizations, we're funding a, num a, a number of leaders that are in the regional district that are actually delivering uh, projects for the benefit of fish, wildlife, forests, and all the species that live within there. And so I'll kick things off uh, today uh, just with a, just a little brief sketch of each of our organizations. And uh, uh, as mentioned, I'm the CEO of the Habitat Conservation Trust Foundation. And who we are is we are a funder, we're a grant funder and we fund conservation projects throughout BC about uh, conservation, um, doing work on the ground and as well as providing education about BC's fish, wildlife and habitat. Each year we receive over uh, 600 proposals and we have a fairly rigorous process of evaluating each of those processes through several technical committees uh, so that we can really put uh, the limited dollars into uh, the hands of those leaders in your community who are delivering these projects amongst COVID and floods, fire, you know, everything that was talked on about earlier today. And so typically we fund about 50% of the proposals. So um, funding is always needed uh, for, for this work. And I'll hand it over to uh, Steve for a quick uh, uh, sketch of FESBC. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Uh, I'm sure most of you know about uh, Forest Enhancement Society of BC, but just in case you don't, we are an agency of the BC government. Our mandate is to go forth and uh, do good things to improve forests and help people and communities and First Nations and protect those communities. Our, our funding model is... Uh, proponent base. So in other words, we rely on the experts uh, in your local areas to come forward and apply for the funding. And uh, I'll talk a bit more about that later on. Thanks, Dan. Thank, thanks, Steve. So together, both of our organizations have come together as we're both granting organization. And as Steve mentioned, we, we rely, we really rely on proponents, whether that's you know, Indigenous nations, academics, you know, for us, it includes individuals, nonprofit organizations. And together, uh, we then grant this funding out uh, to, these, to these leaders in, in the community. So FESBC and HTTF came together back in 2016 to join forces uh, to be able to deliver more projects on the ground. And in particular, where, where both organizations overlap is in the forest and, and those, uh, those habitats are within the forest for fish, for fish and wildlife. So FESBC really stepped up and committed over $5.8 million uh, beginning in 2016. And each year we co-fund a number of projects. And just to give you a couple idea, ideas of those, those projects that we fund. So the first is a, a project that we're funding around the Stein uh, area with, with uh, monitoring the grizzly bear population. This is an ongoing long-term project working with both in, led by Indigenous nations and the province uh, to really pull the information on grizzly bears to inform those management plans that are within this regional district and outside of the regional district. The second uh, is another project uh, 
in uh, within the regional district that focuses on moose and moose is a really significant species both within this regional district and several are several other regional districts and again it's pulling that information from the population looking at the numbers the habitat where moose are to feed better management of the species so the core core you know, aspect of it. It's not just monitoring for monitoring sake, but our organization making sure that information gets into management plans and better decisions for fish wildlife uh, within BC. And then finally, uh, a final project of a more of a citizen driven project by the BC Conservation Foundation of an outreach of about bats in the local communities, how to protect that issues around um, in, in you know, coexisting bats with uh, barns and a lot and uh, landowners as well. But taking a step back uh, to about HCTF, uh, we are a nonprofit uh, charitable foundations. We began in government in 1981, but uh, left as left government in 2007 as now as a nonprofit foundation. And one of our primary funding uh, sources is through the hunting, and fishing, guiding, and trapping licenses that all Brit that number of British Columbians buy each year. And so a portion of those licenses called a surcharge, which is uh, over and above the actual license. So an additional surcharge comes to us each year to um, uh, then reallocate in the terms of these proposals that we receive. One of the other big aspects of our funding is partnerships. And that's with FESBC uh, this, this year and for the last number of years, they've been a great partner providing that additional funding so that we can fund more great projects on the ground. Uh, just to give you an idea, quick, uh, some statistics. Uh, since we began in 1981, we've approved over $195 million in grants uh, for fish and wildlife projects throughout BC. And on the map there, it's just a quick little sketch of, you know, the number of projects that exist each year um, within within BC. So when we're dropping down to a scale, looking at specifically this year, uh, HCTF approved over $9.3 million in projects uh, this year, um, and uh, which was probably our hot, which was not probably, was our highest year ever in terms of revenue for projects owing in a large part to partnerships. Uh, and FESBC is one of the key le leading ones. Um, but in this year, when we look specifically within this regional district, we approved about three quarters of a million dollars for 13 projects. A couple of those of, of more notable projects are a project relating to the steelhead. So obviously the interior uh, Fraser uh, steelhead is, uh, continues to be a species uh, in decline and concern. And uh, again, it's, we're funding a, a couple projects that actually continue to pull uh, the information from these species to feed a number of the needs, you know, on planning needs uh, for First Nations, the province and the federal as they continue to plan and uh, try and manage the fisheries there. You know, another project is with the uh, bighorn sheep in the area, uh, again, uh, looking at these species and one of the particular diseases that these Fraser bighorn ha uh, have is is um, a pneumonia species uh, short and the short uh, uh, name of it is called movie that can transmit between domestic sheep and uh, and the wild bighorn so this project again it's testing the wild bighorn population looking at those species that may have this uh, pneumonia and then removing them from this from the species and this is important to help inform the outreach with not only uh, what uh, domestic sheep um, uh, producers but the wild sheep and how to better manage that population uh, and then finally you know education that's a really key part you know of our, our funding we fund a number of uh, programs and grants for k-12 to a number of uh, we fund a number of facilitators within the regional district that then help out the teachers uh, producing information uh, for students and connecting them with nature, whether that's on a school field trip or doing that nature based work right on the school grounds. And with that, I'll hand it over to Steve. Thanks, Dan. So directors and mayors, uh, you, you know that having healthy uh, wildlife populations. Uh, is very important to you and me and, and all of your constituents and all British Columbians. And in order to achieve that goal, we need to have really good management of our wildlife habitat. 
And so that's why it's uh, one of the, the main goals for the Forest Enhancement Society. And we've only been around for five years, unlike HCTF, they've been around for 40 years. But when we were created, we looked around and we saw that the HCTF was there. We saw that they had a ton of biological management expertise on staff and, and through their partnerships, and that they've been managing uh, and administrating an excellent program for, for, for a long time. And so for, for us, it was a no-brainer to have FAST join up with the Habitat Conservation Trust Foundation to help uh, together to achieve that goal. Uh, in addition to wildlife habitat, um, FAST also has some other goals. Uh, one of them is to help protect communities and reduce their risk to wildfire. And so we're very proud to have helped 120 communities all around British Columbia, including in your region, uh, to do just that. Another uh, goal is to re reduce greenhouse gases and use forestry as a tool. You know, under the Paris Agreement, er many, many countries, the vast majority of countries around the world have signaled uh, a commitment to, to take action on climate change. And uh, in accordance with international carbon accounting standards, uh, forestry is recognized globally as a very significant tool. And in British Columbia, and particularly rural British Columbia, where we live, it's probably one of the biggest tools that we have there where we can do our part to make a difference. And so we're, we're very proud to have helped, uh, will have helped by this summer, by, by the end of this summer, we will have uh, removed the equivalent of a, over a million vehicles off the road for a year. And so when I say that we have a big tool, that, that's what I mean, we can really make a difference. And we've been able to do that while um, uh, creating great jobs for, for people, helping the forest sector and the forest industry transition from a lot of sawmills to fewer sawmills. And we're able to use more of the, the fiber in the forest that otherwise would have been burned. And uh, I know Mayor Blackwell is familiar with the project in his backyard. Um, next slide, please, Dan. <clears throat> So I could go on and on. We have over uh, just about 270 projects all around uh, the province, 30 of which are in, inside of the TNRD uh, jurisdictions. Here's a list of communities where we've had projects successfully over the last five years, Big Bar, Clinton, Logan Lake, Kamloops, Barrier, Merritt, Skeetchison, Hat Creek, Clearwater, Fox Farm, Lindley Creek, Savannah, Face Lake, Pasco Lake, Aspen Grove, and Stump Lake. And I thought I would mention this, this other project, a uh, couple of them, they're just outside of the TNRD boundaries, but the fiber that resulted from these projects that we did came into the TNRD uh, area to be utilized to make green energy. And hopefully that green energy, you know, the electricity can be exported to Alberta or California and in those cases, it might reduce the amount of fossil fuels that are burned to make electricity or, or pellets uh, to displace coal uh, that's burned and, and around the world. So thank you, uh, directors, uh, because uh, of the excellent uh, experts that you have in your areas. Uh, we have many, many proponents, all kinds. Uh, some of which are local governments, uh, regional districts themselves, or sometimes they will hire a consulting firm to represent them and uh, many First Nations. So you should be very proud of, of what you've done to help recover from the mega fires that we've had, what we've done to help reduce the impact of future forest fires, to improve future timber supply, and to do our part to mitigate climate change. Thanks, Dan. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I have some questions for you, starting with Director Stamer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Steve and Dan. Uh, Steve, I've, I've enjoyed uh, working with you in the past. Um, I have a question. Uh, I'm not sure if it's on your mandate, but what about wire fire um, enhancement? I mean, for a case in point, uh, the White Rock fire out of Monty Lake, I mean, you know, that's quite an extensive area that was burnt. And now there's still a lot of animals that are actually still up there. Is there any thought process in being able to try to enhance some of the areas that are still green? And then, you know, whether we have to take it one step further and maybe offer, you know, hunting buffers and things like that 
to try to build that up while the, you know, while the uh, natural uh, vegetation is, is coming back again, sometimes sooner than later. Is there any thought in, in trying to do something there? Well, that thought is, uh, is present in, you know, I think every single one of our projects that we've done around the province, anytime we do a wildfire risk reduction project or uh, helping a forest recover from a wildfire, if it's experienced one, uh, we're always looking for ways to improve forest recreation, to improve civil culture, to improve wildlife habitat, and uh, to reduce greenhouse gases. And the, the good news is, is we can often do all of those things with a single project. On the, the topic of wildlife displacement as a result of fire and, and transitioning across the landscape, I'll, I'll let Dan answer that question. No, and, and I think as Steve mentioned too, uh, I know, you know as a granting organization, we haven't had a lot of direct uh, discussion with, with the province, but I do know those conversations are going on, um, on you know, uh, more I think thinking about the future um, and also looking at what's what's possible in the in the present in terms of some of those areas. I don't have anything specific in my head. I just know that those conversations are going on. And as Steve mentioned, this is the great opportunity when you've got just different organizations working together because we're looking at things through multiple lenses to create those benefits for the community. You know whether you're a hunter or, or you're you're just accessing and looking for access uh, for walking on a, on a number of issues. So they're happening, but nothing specific that I can point to at the moment. Thank you, Director Rice. I think Merlin was ahead of me, but thank you, Chair. Um, thanks, Dan and Steve. Really, really appreciate it. And I'm glad you're doing some work in the regional district. Of course, whenever I hear the wild uh, Thompson River steelhead brought up, which is uh, arguably best of class in the entire world. I get my feathers ruffled a little bit. Um, uh, for one thing on the projects, uh, are some of these partnerships that were indigenous, I do believe. And I, I'm glad, and I hope that continues because I do believe uh, this, the closure of the sports fishery has closed, uh, made uh, Spencer's Bridge a, a seasonal town instead of a year round town for the last three years, we have become seasonal because of singly because of the closure of the Thompson River Steelhead while and while I support that it's I think going to uh, you know uh, endangered species for the three time to the federal government which it doesn't get approved for so I haven't given up on the wild Thompson River Steelhead the First Nations has done a good job of uh, you know uh, policing the the capture of the steelhead and, and things like that and i think that's it's an important food and ceremonial fishery for our first nations community and if we bring that back the sports fishery would follow on the coattails of that automatically so if we can get to that point my question to you is um, on the funding and is it an ongoing funding process or are there deadlines associated to different funding channels um, to continue to try to save this precious resource. Great, thank you, thank you, Director Rice. And I, as you mentioned, I, I one of the great trends I think is I see we're seeing a lot more uh, joint funding or Indigenous-led proposals to our organization, uh, particularly on the fish. And and uh, we've been having some discussion with the province how we can help in, you know that continue because I do agree the you know when we're combining with the Indigenous nations and other organizations, whether it's the province or others, we, we, we have more of a chance in recovering some of those populations. Um, our funding typically is November for the most of our projects. Um, and after I can follow up with you and give you a quick little, uh, uh, send you a quick little email about it. We've got some different ones for land acquisitions, but if you're talking really about enhancement of habitat, usually November, um, and we do accept both single and multi-year projects. Uh, so for work like this, you want to look at multi-year. So I'll follow up with you. So you've got some dates. Thank, Thank you, you, Director Blackwell. I have directors Blackwell, Watson, and Singh. And that will be it. We're out of our allotted time already, but we'll extend it for a few minutes. Director Blackwell. Yeah, thank you, Dan. Um, my dad's Paul Blackwell, former head of the BC Trappers Association and instructor. So big fan of your projects for a lot of years, but my question is for Steve. What's the current funding status of FESBC? Is there any attempt for a provincial injection of money into your program? Because I am terrified that we're now moving from meters of interface wildfire protection to kilometers 
predators and we're not even talking about what we need to do farther out in the forest to protect our communities where are you at and what can we do to have you don't have to tell us what we can do to advocate but where are you at uh mayor blackwell you've done an excellent job on speaking out on uh on a topic that's important for you for you and your your constituents and uh appreciate that uh as an agency of the crown uh we're kind of like think of us like icbc or lotteries or fairies except we're much smaller we only have six staff um but we 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 think and and well we know because we have numbers to measure it that we're having a big impact in a whole bunch of ways uh in in terms of helping uh, emerging indigenous forest companies uh, participate in the forest economy like they never have before. And we're helping with those transitions the, in the way that Clearwater has experiencing uh, transitioning uh, our forest sector to, to a greener forest sector with increased bioenergy. So those are all good things. And, and uh, but uh, we cannot speak out or advocate for ourselves. Uh, we are apolitical, we transcend governments, they come and go, even mayors and directors will come and go over time. And we hope to be around for, for decades into the future. So um, in terms of what the word is, what the status is, I mean, that's a decision for, for cabinet and, and even more specifically treasury board, and it's inherently a political decision. So I'm just not gonna comment on, on that. Other than to say, I think, as you know, uh, Mayor Blackwell, that we have currently allocated all of the $238 million that we have received to date, and we are on track to complete the final projects this summer. And then that's it. Thank you. That was what I was afraid of. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Director Watson. Thank you. Speaking of funding, um, we have a project in my area mapping and assigning trails so that uh, people who are out there don't get quite so lost. And I was hoping um, that uh, you might be a source of some funding for that project. Any chances? It's, uh, it's, it's possible, you know, typically projects when we're looking at mapping and trailing, we also want to create Pro projects that actually create, you know, whether you call them guardians or stewards in the future. So we've moved transitioned years ago from just getting mapping done and signage to also adding a component that's required of how are you going to create stewards and uh, in the future. So I think with a uh, with maybe some discussion with our staff, we might be able to find a project funding that can meet. And I just made a note. I can follow up with you as well too, just on some of the timelines and and uh, put you in touch with some of our staff that can help you know build build a project thank you thank you and director singh finally thank you Terry gillis i have just two questions uh, welcome uh, gentlemen thanks for coming today um one is around climate action and the one's around indigenous relationships so on climate action part i, I sit on the promises climate solutions council and last year and I've, it's been going on for a lot longer than that um, I, I haven't heard much about forestry there. I heard a little bit of forestry there, and I, I'm wondering um, how uh, Protector Steve feels around, you know, the, the sort of the understanding in the province in terms of the planning we've done around climate. It really incorporates uh, the great work that's happening in forestry and the great opportunity in forestry to help decarbonize. First question. Yeah, um, yeah. Unfortunately, it's it's not really well known as it should be about how powerful forestry could be as a tool to help us take action on climate change. But uh, but we're getting there. I mean, I'm I'm doing my darnness. Uh, the BC government is, and and a number of others. Um, but I think it starts with with us, you, and and me, and all the people that we engage in, and recognizing that forestry can make a big difference and uh, it can provide jobs at the same time. So I see it as a way of transitioning British Columbia, rural British Columbia to building a, a larger bioeconomy that's green and su sustainable. Um, yeah, so hopefully that just trend just continues. Yeah, so I, I, I'm happy to help um, 
uh, in terms of maybe I'm having a briefing for the Climate Solutions Council of the province on the work that you're doing. I know that my friend Rob Van Andrewkamp up in Prince George has been doing as well with the bioenergy stuff up there as well. So happy to talk to you. I'll find more about that. Um, the second thing is around um, indigenous relationships. And obviously, um, given the history, it's really important that indigenous communities do have pride of place and do lead. Um, one of the things that I've kind of found, practically speaking, is that um, sometimes it happens, that even the province does this, but they, they, they start talking to indigenous communities first, and they don't talk to local governments for quite a, a while, and that causes friction between uh, it, uh, between groups that are maybe unnecessary and also uh, the citizens we represent and kind of get a little bit worried about what's kind of going on. So any best practices around how to do that in a way it might work a bit, bit more uh, smoothly, I guess, because sometimes I find like the pendulum swung all the other way now where, you know, where, where local governments aren't involved as much as they probably should be. And even if we don't actually have a, a vote at the table to be there to, to sort of advise and be observers, I think is very important. So um, what's your what's your sort of uh, guidance on that? Well, um, my observations based on our success in, in you know, and, and I, by success, uh, I mean that out of the $238 million that we've deployed so far, 30% has gone to Indigenous peoples or, or projects that have a very significant uh, First Nations involvement. And um, it's been transformational. I've heard chiefs say, well, you know, thanks for the, the money. Uh, we've done these projects and it's provided some employment for our band members. But you should know, Steve, that it's more than just a job. It provides self-esteem. It makes gives so many social benefits, you know, and I don't want to speak out of turn, but, uh, you know, it's not a big stretch to imagine that if you're in a community with 80% unemployment, that those jobs can reduce domestic violence, improve academic performance in children, uh, reduce substance abuse, uh, reduce property crime. And uh, I'm just so proud. I never imagined when I got into forestry that, you know, we could have such a profound social uh, beneficial impact on people. And um, yeah, and it's transformational. Some First Nations are saying, you know, for the first time, they feel like they're leading the project. So what comes out of that is, um, you know, not having any strings attached. Uh, if the provincial government has a funding program, um, it's difficult for them to separate the issues of rights and title and treaty negotiations from the funding. Whereas when they're dealing with FAS, it's just about the project and helping the people in the communities. And I, I think that would be the single most important uh, piece of advice that I would have. Uh, as far as local government developing partners, I've seen examples um, all over the place now in, in different communities. So I think there's there's opportunities there, particularly around economic development. Yeah, great comments. Really appreciate them. Thank you. Thank you ever so much. And thank that's a nice note to, to end on. And thank you both gentlemen for appearing before us today. It was a most interesting presentation. It's, uh, it's uh, gone a bit over time, but it was well worth it. Thank you kindly. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a great evening. Well, that takes us to building infraction. Uh, Alexander Yeager and Elena Yeager, uh, item 7.3. This is an opportunity for the owners to make representation to the board. Is there any wish, anyone wishing to speak to this particular uh, building infraction issue? Uh, Ms. Campbell. Mr. Gillis, um, Mr. Yeager is not, uh, not going to be making representations today, but I did speak to him uh, earlier today, and he did just want to pass on and advise that he does have a plan to complete um, an issuable uh, building permit application. Um, and hopes to uh, have that submitted prior to um, February 28th. And he did note, and he has been in touch with um, our development services department that the staff in that department have provided him with a, a very helpful booklet on all the requirements that need to be met uh, in order for him um, to meet that deadline. Thank you so much. That will take us then to uh, 7.4. Uh, a similar matter with uh, Nicolette Schreiber. Is there anyone? 
Hey, that's me. Thank you. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I will, I'll ask you to uh, confine your comments to a maximum of 10 minutes, please, because we are on a fairly tight uh, agenda here, but please go ahead. How about now? Does now work? Now works. Thanks very much. Oh, that's fabulous. Well, from what I've listened to, I feel like very small potatoes on this scale. So let's have a little discussion, I guess. Would you like to start? I'm, I'm not sure how this all works, so. Well, I think if you just uh, give us a presentation with respect to uh, with what's uh, before us here, which is uh, which is a, an issue regarding a building infraction with no building permit. And if you had comments with respect to that, or if you have plans to get a building permit or whatever, uh, that's what we're hoping to that hear. Okay, fabulous. Okay, so I have, um, because as you know, the building, um, to get a building permit, you need your septic system approved. Um, so I have an engineer, Octo Engineering from 100 Mile, who will be coming out as soon as the snow melts. Um, once that happens, I'm unsure of the next step, as nobody in your department seemed to know how to help me, as I don't really um, apply for a home builder or owner builder. Um, I don't even know how to say it, but an owner builder because I've already built the building. So I'm hoping that once I get the septic approved, I can just get a building inspector in to then go through the house and then we can make arrangements from there. Is that kind of what I'm understanding to be the course of action? Okay, and was there anything uh, that you wish to add to that? Oh, I actually asked a question there that I'd like to answer. So if anybody could help me answer that question, that would be really helpful. Uh, Ms. Campbell, did you have a comment or a question? Oh, I think maybe Ms. Sadokova might be available um, to answer Ms. Schreiber's question. That would be fabulous. Hello, uh, can you hear me? I can. Oh, so through the chair, if I may, um, last September, we provided the building guide, the zoning information, all the same information that we routinely provide when we find there's dwellings or full buildings built without a permit. It's the same information we provided to the Jaegers that were um, had called the corporate officer earlier. So that's more than that, short of applying for them, which we obviously cannot do, that's all we can do is encourage. Time has gone by. So I would suggest we are, we staff are very, very willing to provide all that information again to, to- I have all this information. So- And I've read through this information. And then I've read through your home builders course, and I've read through all the stipulations that go along with that as well. And because I built it, I would have to get the permit I cannot get a permit without the homeowner certificate. And I can't get that because I don't qualify because I already built the house. Does that make sense? Like this is kind of the loop that I'm stuck in. And I've like, I'm totally cool to help you like work through this. I am pumped to get legal. This is not an issue. I'm just not sure how to proceed once the septic approves the system for getting the permit specifically in this specific situation. So again, through the chair, with the whole board in assembly, um, this is probably not the most appro appropriate part to get into the details of a building permit application. Um, oh, we can provide all that information to Ms. Schreiber again. Um, she can contact the homeowners protection office staff for information on their act and uh, short of getting into more detail, there's really nothing else I can offer at this point. 
Okay, well, that's totally fine. Um, that would be great. Is that number, like, I didn't see that number anywhere in that package. I can look it up online so, and I will send it to her. You are absolutely okay. amazing. Thank you so much. So would it be possible then because of, you know, all the crises and work shortages and people shortages and man, the fact that I made 23 grand last year, um, is it possible to be able to get kind of an extension and until the end of next, this coming summer, I guess, to be able to get the building permit septic system, I can keep in contact with you guys. None of this is an issue. Would that work for you guys? Do you have a timeline that you would recommend, uh, Ms. Dukova, or is it, have we gone over that already? Uh, I don't, I'm not sure if this is the time to discuss it or whether when the item is up on the agenda later, what is your pleasure? I think that's appropriate when it comes up later on the agenda. Okay. And in the meantime, we'll thank Ms. Schreiber for her presentation. And okay, that takes, and then you guys will just talk. That takes us so to uh, building infraction 2945, Buffalo Springs Road. There is a recommendation. Mr. Chair, I do. Oops, oh, sorry. Director Kershaw? Yes, I, I do believe that uh, uh, Deanna just said that these people had spoke to them and they would have this. And I'd like to see us maybe delay this until after February the 28th when this was supposed to be, they were supposed to have everything straightened out. Ms. Campbell? Oh. Thank, thank you, Chair. Oh, yeah, but they... So, so, so Mr. Yeager is aware of, of this recommendation and that, and that the notice um, would only be placed on title if we haven't received the building permit application by February 28th. So he, he is committed in letting the board know that he will be able to meet um, this February 28th deadline. So if we move this, then we can, he has till February the 28th to make the deadline. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. I'll second the motion. Is there any discussion? Oh, Susan Swan. Susan Swan. Director Swan. Thank you, Chair. I presume that's February 28, 2022, not 2021. <laughs> that's my mistake. Yes, 2022. Thank you. Good eyes. <laughs> good, good work, Director Swan. <laughs> Is there any further discussion? All in favor? Is anyone opposed? No one opposed, that's carried. That takes us to 2955 Buffalo Springs Road. And uh, there is a recommendation and perhaps, uh, yeah, let, let's move the recommendation and perhaps uh, after that, uh, Ms. Dilkova can elaborate a bit on what she thinks would be appropriate course of action. I'll move the recommendation. And then second. Moved and seconded. Uh, is there any discussion? Ms. Dilkova? Ms. Dilkova? Right. You can say Madam Planner, it's easier than the last name I was given. So in a case like this, of course, we will work proactively with the owner. However, as per the photos in the report of the buildings, this is unlike the other um, item you just moved where the owner has been working uh, cooperatively with us. It, it appears to be built, the other building appears to be built very soundly. These buildings are not. They are so far off the building code that it's not to say that it's not possible to bring them up to building code, but I would suggest that any date and going uh, you know, six months or a year into the future, there's no point in that. It only costs $200 to remove the notice on title. And I do have a, uh, a policy committee report on this coming tomorrow. So I stand by the staff recommendation that it be put on the title now, more than any other reason to indemnify the regional district because they have not been, those buildings are not to code and have not been built soundly. Thanks ever so much. Uh, Director Blackwell. Yeah, just as information for the public online uh, through to uh, Madam, planner <laughs> um, this 
sorry, um, not to make fun of this in any sense. Uh, this is serious business, but um, this in no way, this is just a, a, a notice on title. There is no immediate need for the owners to remove, destroy, dismantle these, these buildings. They still have the opportunity to work through the process of getting uh, a regular building permit or and trying to rectify this, but this is our initial step in dealing with a situation like this. This 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 doesn't really force them out of their homes. Thank you. That's my understanding too, Director Blackwell. Is there any further discussion on the recommendation? Seeing none, all in favor. Is anyone opposed? That's I see no one opposed. That's carried. Takes us to bylaws. Uh, there's a report from the CFO and two recommendations on revenue anticipation. Moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Move to. And, oh, just a minute. Can I ask for any opposed? No one's opposed. Carried? No, move to. <laughs> Is there a seconder? Second. Moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Opposed, if any? That's carried. Uh, development applications. There's an application for a floodplain exemption and a recommendation. Sorry? We have a motion for. Move for discussion. Second. Okay, is there any discussion? Director Laird. Or, no, okay, Director Elliott first. Uh, Mr. Chairman, when I read this, um, I, I think about all the people who lost pieces of their property over the summer floods and some of them to the fires. And I'm dead set against having a um, an exemption to anything on a water course right now. I think that we have spent enough money over the last couple of years with floods and what that not that you don't live, need to live with your feet in the river. So the, the uh, mapping shows that that house can be put farther back and they don't need the exemption. So I'm, I'm fully against this. Okay, Director Singh. Uh, should we go, uh, just, just on the Fraser Basin Council um, flood mapping, which is updated and they're using that as a bit of a, uh, a rationale here. We fund, we help fund some of that, some of that uh, work. And we use that not true, but we actually help fund some of the Fraser Basin work. So I, I prefer them to come to us uh, as a, as a group to talk to us about the flood mapping that they've done. So we can also hear not just from a consultant and from a proponent, but from the Fraser Basin Council itself around what the flood mapping actually is saying so that we have a more comprehensive understanding. So I, I, I appreciate that recommendation here, but I'm also a bit leery about anything that I haven't actually seen, a, um, you know, the actual from horse's mouth, so to speak, you know, work about. So I, I'm likely to support it today uh, but I, I, I'm, I'm happy to hear from the Basin Council about what the flood mapping has, has shown through the, the LIDAR, the, 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 the laser or something they've done that kind of has really been very, very um, much more granular than we had it before and, and, and make a decision after that. So I'm, I'm not for supportive today, no. Thank you. Uh, I think you have your hand up, Director Laird. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chair. When we've uh, seen the drastic flooding that's happened uh, in the Nicola Valley. Um, I am concerned about the TNRD board still allowing variations to the floodplain. Um, I was just wondering uh, whether we have any obligation or if we have any sort of, uh, um, <clears throat> I guess, uh, problem with issuing a, license, a, a permit and removing some of the requirements of floodplain. Is that a liability for the TNRD if we do that, or is it not? I can see it probably would be eventually. I'm going to defer to uh, Ms. Adilkova on that, but I think that uh, the registration of the restrictive covenant, which is part of the 
recommendation would probably be expected to address that potential liability. Uh, Ms. Dilkeba, can you comment on this? Yeah. Yes, that's absolutely correct. There is currently a covenant that was placed on title at this, in the subdivision creation in the 1990s, and there would be a further covenant to indemnify. Um, so the, the content, basically, the slot would be sterilized without an exemption. So that's one reason why they're at it. And I'm sure they would be willing to, they, the, the engineer and or the Fraser Basin Council may be willing to attend a meeting to speak to it. And did you wish to comment at all on the, uh, on the recommendation itself to um, why um, it would be positive? I kind of anticipated some, some, pushback on this particular recommendation uh, in light of recent flooding. So uh, is there any particular reason that, that this one should be, yeah. in your view, of Peru? So in on page two in the summary, we acknowledge given this year and even flooding in other years, it's uh, staff are very cognizant of the discomfort to recommend an exemption. But in this case, when we, just for a little bit of background, and again, the board may table this matter or defer, pardon me, I think the right word is defer it to a future board meeting. Well, well, well. Behind me. Um, but first, uh, the province created this lot by subdivision. They put a covenant on it. The proposal meets that. In, it would have met our previous zoning bylaw for construction. But in 2012, when we redid our zoning bylaw, we reviewed all the floodplain setbacks, so horizontal and flood construction level, vertical with the province and the province, because we're not the subject matter experts, uh, they said on the Thompson River, double it. They didn't check what covenants were on the land. In this case, because there's been a proper engineering review, it complies with the covenant and it complies with the flood mapping that the Fraser Basin, that's why, um, and, and the siting, the hardship, basically if they don't build here, they wouldn't be able to build anywhere on this parcel. And there are other, if I can just if you can bring up the PowerPoint, I have like three slides all, um, I don't think gonna be legible, just of the area, because it's not on the Fraser or the Thompson River proper, it is on an ephemeral channel. Oh, so it looks, this is the parcel. It's about, I believe 20 acres just under that. And it has the railway going through the two railways. So there, what you see there, and I'm sorry, it's a bit bright in here. The property lot, lot line would run about there. So where there's buildings here, it would be about here. Um, so this is the main, you can see the braiding of the river. So there is a little bit of water in here. Um, so yeah, that's where the house would be. This is a view of that same, we were getting these images from different times of the year and different sources. And this, we actually went all the way to the site. We took these photos. So you don't even see the river where they're proposing to build. But you, might in spring. but you might in spring during Prichette, absolutely. So they're not in those channels. They're um, that channel, this um, present and, and original natural boundary that the setback is taken from there, not the main channel of the river. And I, that's all I had. So um, I'm sure they would like, there's been quite a bit of pressure and we've spent an inordinate amount of staff time on this particular file, uh, precisely for the reasons that the board has discussed today. So like I said, I would suggest that the applicants be given a kick at this in front of the board and we get input from Fraser uh, Basin Council and their consultants, BGC. Thanks very much, Director Laird. One of the concerns I've had is the dealing was with the Stump Lake flooding. Um, they had never seen water as high as it's ever been before. It actually impacted um, 
probably about six properties that were actually put into existing flood elevations at the time and it exceeded those um, elevations. And uh, the TNRD got in a fair, an unfair discussion over the fact that the TNRD issued the building licenses with an inappropriate elevation to protect the houses. And uh, I don't wanna see that happen again. It puts the owners of the, of the property they feel because we've given them a permit, we are responsible and have allowed them to build there. Then it doesn't matter what sort of legal uh, implications there are, they still hold the TNRD responsible for issuing a permit. And when you look at those pictures, that's a floodplain. You don't want to put a house there. You don't want to invest that kind of money. So I, I can't support this at all. Thank you. Thank you, Director Staver. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And further to what Director Laird has mentioned, uh, you know, we've seen a lot of examples in the last couple of years. A uh, really good case in point is Brookmere, where you look at the aerial photos and you look at all these homes that were built on the alluvial fan from the creek, and now it's come and done it again 80 years later or whatever, and it's done exactly the same thing. So I certainly would want to be deferring this. You know, the, the recommendation is totally different than what Mrs. Savokova is just recommending on some of the other things that we should be doing on properties like this. This is already a long enough meeting. I'm either suggesting we defer it or... I'm not going to be supporting this. Thank you. Uh, Director Rice. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm familiar with the property and uh, and uh, and I know this has been not a uh, um, this has been an ongoing thing. They've been working on this for quite some time. I don't know the the folks working on it personally, actually, but uh, I do know the property and uh, though I'm real reluctant as an evacuee and seeing the river do something that I never thought in my lifetime I would see the Nicola River I'm talking about, I would certainly support deferral of this until a better time and we get a little better look at this, so. Thanks, I, Director Rice. Director Elliott, maybe you could turn your microphone off. Uh, your mic. Where did my question go? Thank you. Uh, so has anyone actually moved to defer this? Can I, I'll make a motion to defer. I'll second. Any discussion? Oh, I'm sorry, direct, uh, Ms. Campbell. I'm gonna whip out my Robert's Rules of Procedure. Um, so it would, actually, it would actually be a motion to postpone it to a certain time. So if we could. That we could, works for me, thanks. So if Thank we could you. pick a time, if I don't know if it's the February 3rd meeting or the February 25th meeting, we have two meetings in February or a later time in March, but if we could just attach a, a time to it, that would be great. We say the February 25th meeting? Sure, uh, let's say February 25th, without going to provide adequate time for, yeah, I see Ms. Adilkova nodding, so. Uh, Director Singh? So to pos we, right. we can Let's perhaps on. change it. Of course, I don't know what their schedules are and what their commitments would be, but that gives them over a month. So it would be for that. So we'd want to have both the engineer who wrote the report, who relied on the other engineers and the Fraser Basin Council's work. So we, I would think we would need to have them both. Okay, thank you. I just, so I just repeat, repeat the question. I know my mic on. So it's really to get for the ability to get the um, uh, the information uh, more detail about that from the either the base council and the consultant and potentially the applicant. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Director Stamer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Appreciate that. Uh, to Mr. Volkova, can you uh, also um, confirm that if somebody builds a home in a floodplain or somewhere like that, and it is uninsurable with the laws today, they're still eligible for up to $300,000 for the province if that property floods? I, do, I can't, I don't know. I'd have to do some homework and I will do that and get back to you because you can buy flood insurance in some places or you could last year I, I understand that the reason i'm asking the question is that from what i understand from what happened in in merit is that some of the places that would not have would not be able to get insurance yeah. not because they chose not to but the fact that they could not purchase insurance 
that the province would still ensure would still give them up to three hundred thousand dollars. I just like clarification. That's all. I'll, I'll clarify that. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on the postponement? Seeing none. All in favor? No. Opposed, if any. Oh, Director Rice. Yeah, I just had a quick question, Chair. Thank you for that. Before I, I since Director Laird brought it up, is this? I, I read the report, but I can't remember. Was it indicated that this, where they're going to build, is in the floodplain, uh, Madam Planner? <laughs> so, it is in our zoning bylaw floodplain, correct? It just is not in the floodplain covenant that was registered on title in 1992. Thank you. Okay, any further discussion? I'll call again. All in favor? Opposed, if any. I see no one opposed. That's carried. I think we will take a break now uh, for five to 10 minutes and carry on at 315. Okay, let me get out of here. Where am I at here?
Okay, so we're back in session, and this brings us to reports. And our CAO has a verbal report for us to begin with. Thank you, Chair Gillis. Zoom can hear me okay? We had problems with the speaker earlier, or this microphone. All right, good afternoon again, everyone. Uh, today, I just have a few updates to share with the group. Uh, first update will be around COVID-19. My second update will be around our 2021-2022 Strate strategic plan update. And then the third thing will be a BDO forensic audit update. Uh, so firstly, uh, our pande pandemic safety plan continues to remain a top priority. Uh, as we are all aware, Omicron continues to hit, uh, hit hard uh, and our staff are no exception. Uh, we like many organizations are continuing to have cases and exposures, uh, but we are following our safety protocols and managing the best we can. Like today, our board meetings are conducted as safely as possible with appropriate spacing and masks uh, with a number of uh, directors on Zoom. We have recently updated our work from home policy and are working with our teams to ensure we have, uh, working, we're, we're working safely and productively. Uh, we are hopeful that the COVID-19 outlook uh, will start to change and we're looking forward to some much needed normalcy. Uh, second topic, um, I would like to provide a quick update uh, on our strategic plan. Uh, most of uh, 2021 has been a bit of a blur with wildfires, flooding, and the forensic audit. Uh, we have done our best to keep our priorities on track, but as you can imagine, many have, have not progressed in the way that we would have expected uh, this past year. We are certainly hoping to make up some ground for the balance of 2022. Uh, I am planning on providing the board with a, full, uh, with a more full and formal status update at the next meeting in February. I will be able to share more details and provide you with more specific status uh, with respect to our action items uh, within the six areas of focus. Uh, it'll be either complete, in progress, or not started, and I'll be walking through each and every one of those at our next meeting. In addition to this board update, um, I'm going to also propose a seventh and very critical, um, I guess, priority, and that would be the BDO recommendations response. Uh, like our strategic plan, this needs to be a very significant focus uh, and will be my personal priority. We have started to lay out a strategy that will provide some important plans that I feel will help us move forward in a productive way. Uh, just going to share just a few of those plans. So number one, uh, we've created a TNRD response document that you all would have seen that will allow us to provide status updates on a regular basis uh, to the board and the public. Uh, we have developed a detailed policy development framework to guide our work. Uh, training is going to be very important as well in the overall strategy as we work through uh, our plans to ensure both staff and the board uh, receive the training needed to be successful. Uh, we are setting up a working group that will lead this change from the administrative side of the organization and will continue to support and coordinate with Chair Sinclair and the policy committee. And together we will make the necessary changes to reestablish the foundation. Uh, a technical team has been created to, uh, to build both the landing page on our website and the content needed to be fully transparent and proactive as we implement these recommendations and provide status updates on the progress from the forensic audit. And then finally, we will also uh, be providing public updates at every board meeting in 2022 uh, to highlight our progress. And then finally, I've got the third topic I wanted to talk about, and that would be our, our forensic audit. Uh, I wanted to provide some further information and updates concerning the BDO forensic audit, along with the recommendations that we'll be reviewing on the next agenda item. Uh, as you are aware, uh, my goal was to provide a timely, fulsome, and transparent delivery of the full report from BDO in January subject to the TNRD's legal obligations. We remain committed to providing meaningful public disclosure while still ensuring that the TNRD's statutory obligations are properly discharged. Uh, this has been my priority since the public presentation in December of 2021. I'm happy to report that we are working through the final stages with our legal counsel and BDO and are expecting the full forensic audit report to be released and available on our website early next week with our goal being Monday. Uh, in the meantime, the BDO recommendations have been made available, as you know, on the agenda, um, and we've also included a progress report on some of the important policy and process changes uh, that have taken place uh, since March of 2020. We certainly have a lot of work ahead of us as staff and as a board. I'm committed to, committed to making this a priority and will re and provide regular updates in a meaningful way. Uh, the management team is well aware of our responsibility and will be held accountable to ensure a smooth and well-communicated change within the organization. So unless you have any questions, that would be my update for today, Chair Gillis. Thanks, Mr. Hildebrand. 
Uh, does anyone have any questions with respect to that before we move on to the uh, recommendation regarding the BDO report? I don't see any questions, so that takes us to 11.12, uh, and there is a recommendation. Second. Moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Not seeing any hands up for discussion. We'll call the question. All in, oh, sorry, Director Sinclair. Just caught me at the last minute there, Kathy. Just in time. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I just wanted to um, be sure that uh, the recommendations are not, it's clear that the recommendations are not only as far as we will go in reviewing our policies, but um, are a starting point. Um, for example, there's a brief mention of gift cards. Um, I would like to see even greater controls over gift cards um, made. So um, I totally support these recommendations. Uh, just wanted to outline that through the policy review committee, we will be uh, making even more recommendations to tighten things up. Thank you. Thanks, Director Sinclair. Fair enough. Uh, Director Rothenberger. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, just a couple of questions for clarification on the uh, presentation of the or the the way the report is laid out. Um, um, I'm not sure that it's entirely clear in a couple of areas. For example, uh, uh, point three. There's a reference to zero tolerance. But then it says creates a higher risk of dishonesty of dishonest or unethical behavior. It sounds like we're saying that that's what zero tolerance does. Is that, is that the intention of of that point? Just clarify on the discussion. Cer uh, certainly, uh, I saw that too. But it, I think it's just a grammatical error, really, when it comes down to it. I'm obviously not that. Um, not the intention to create more uh, more risk for for fraud. But I, I didn't think so. I I just think that that, that it needs to be uh, it needs to be very clear as to what we're saying there. A um, couple of other questions, if I could, just on point thirteen um, regarding the types of expenses for credit cards. Am I to understand there have been no changes to the types of expenses or that the intention is not to change the types of expenses only to change the way in which they're used? I think uh, Ms. Campbell wanted to comment earlier and, and perhaps she can address that question as well. Thank you, Chair. Um, we, we actually have caught a couple of typos. So I, I think that for number three, it's supposed to be um, lack of zero tolerance tone at the top. And then the implication being that creates a higher risk of dishonest or ethical behavior. And there's a couple of other, other ones that we've um, caught since this was um, published. So we'll get that updated because it's important that that's, um, that's clear. Uh, and then with respect to Director Rothenberger's other questions, sorry, Director Rothenberger, was that about whether or not we're looking at the types of purchases that will be allowed on credit cards? Yes, that was the question. What yeah, we so, so, so we are looking at our, we do have a credit card policy, but it doesn't, it doesn't specifically outline, it's an administrative policy, it doesn't specifically outline what can and cannot be you, um, purchased on the credit cards. And so that's a conversation that we've already had myself um, CAO Hildebrand and CFO uh, Mr. Ray, because we do feel that there needs to be some parameters and guidelines about what our corporate credit cards are used for and what they should not be used for and where POs should be used or where we should have accounts um, set up um, and perhaps be paying for things with a different method. Uh, so that's something that we'll be looking at internally among staff. So, okay, so that that's in progress, uh, right? And my, and my final, a uh, question was, uh, I guess, as a follow up to what Director St. Clair was saying about developing policies over and above what's reflected in, in the report today. And I've mentioned a number of times uh, that I would like to see uh, at a minimum quarterly uh, reports on board and staff expenses. 
and uh, that's uh, that's uh, a request that's almost a year old now. And um, is it the intention that that will be brought forward through policy committee, or do I have to uh, present a notice of motion, or what's the process to uh, follow up on on that proposal? Director Rothenberger, I expect you'll probably be hearing something from uh, Mr. Ray at our next uh, February board meeting. Again, um, Mr. Ray, myself, and Mr. Hildebrand met the other day, and he um, has come up with a plan, a proposed plan on how to uh, present this information um, to the board. So that will be forthcoming. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Director Rothenberger. Director Watson, I have Directors Watson, Singh, Brown, and Steamer. Thank you very much. Um, I quite frequently have run into things that don't seem quite right and we need policy changes or new policies on. Uh, this policy review committee, can they work on new policy? Uh, because uh, years ago, we were, I was on the policy review committee and we were stopped from creating new policy because this was a policy review committee. <laughs> so do we need a notice of motion to create a new policy or can we work on new policies in this committee? I think I know the answer, but I'm gonna let Ms. Campbell answer it for you, Director Watson. Thank you, through the chair. So the policy review committee has already um, vetted a number of new policies that we didn't have in existence before. So one of the first things that we brought to the policy review committee was a gap analysis, uh, where staff did some research and looked at um, gaps in our, our policy manual, policies that we currently didn't have in place that we should have in place. And then we also asked the policy review committee members to provide feedback on policies that they felt um, that we should have in place. And so that work is ongoing and it continues. Thank you, Director Singh. Uh, thank you, Director Gillis. First of all, I'm just really happy to see this. I think it really uh, creates a good launching point for the, this era of now, um, you know, the new era that we're, we're working towards. Um, I think that um, uh, this is a very strong set of recommendations. Uh, now, having said that, there's a couple of questions that I have, and I'm glad that, that um, uh, staff have flagged the idea that um, um, you can't always elect people with accounting experience to a board. So for us to be able to actually have that, we have to have some expertise that comes from outside or whatever. It may not always be the case, right? But secondly, I guess this question of the internal, I mean, internal auditor is, is something that I'm kind of a little bit, you know, I'm like, well, do we need, do we have to have, have to employ somebody full-time on the real district's uh, staff whose sole function would be a support for the audit, audit, audit committee. Uh, through, Chair, through Chair Gillis, that, that would be an option. Um, there's also options that we could uh, put out an RFP and contract that service out uh, okay. and, a, and a frequency that makes sense to the board. Well, uh, I, I prefer that. I mean, I think that the idea is that, you know, after this was first sort of uh, released publicly in a way uh, last meeting, whatever that was, there was all this conversation around how we accept this, accept the, the the recommendations. This is where we're accepting recommendations, and we have to kind of look, look through them and kind of see as a board, right? And the last thing I would just say is that it's really important as a board that we have strong um, checks and balances and review of a CAO position. So, um, what what do we do around that, Chair have, have we have do we have an HR committee? Are we thinking about how we would review that position? Not just where was in it, but just basically so we have a good sense of what's happening. I understand now where we are checking the expenses of the CEO, which is great. Uh, and uh, in terms of the performance review stuff, uh, what's happening with that? Do we have any update on that? I don't have an update on that for you, but I know that the matter has come up and that there is uh, uh, policy, in, as far as I know, is being developed in, to have a sort of a, a 360 review of the CAO on a regular basis. I'm sorry, I don't know the exact, I don't know whether it's annual or every couple of years, but certainly I know that there's a, um, a proposal under consideration and but the details of it, I'm not familiar with. I don't know if Ms. Campbell has anything to add to that or not, but it's certainly under consideration and there will be something coming forward on that issue. Okay, and just, uh, I think, just sorry, before I, uh, sorry, go ahead. You're the chair, Dave. 
Director Singh. Um, so Amanda Ellison, our general manager of um, people and engagement, she's looking into um, what 360 performance review mechanism would be the best for us to use. And she'll, she'll touch base with the chair um, on that for specifically the CAO. However, we are looking at implementing 360 performance reviews, not just for the CAO, but for all senior management. And we would likely look at doing those, um, the frequency that we do our performance reviews, which currently are twice, twice per year right now. Yeah, so and obviously the board's concerned about the CAO specifically. Well, obviously the CAO's job is to review the staff, right? So, I mean, from my perspective, the new board when they come in in 2022, again, this year, have to really have a strong understanding of how that process works. Because believe me, the time I've been in local government, that can be done really poorly, and it can be done really well. And, it's, and it's, it's sometimes done quite poorly. So I think it's really important that we have a strong um, understanding as a board, especially the new board coming in, about how we're reviewing the CEO position and not to be you know, sitting over someone's shoulder, but to do our due diligence. So what happened in the past can't happen again in the future. And I'm sure that will be in place well before the new board uh, comes in, Director Singh. Dire uh, Mr. Hildebrand. I would just like to follow up on that. I, I welcome that. Um, I think that's something that I would, uh, and any CEO would, would needs in that role, and we need to know what's going well and what our opportunities are. Uh, so I've had that process in my past CAO roles, and it's something that uh, this board needs to take seriously and really uh, engage in because I think it's important both to the CAO and the entire organization. Thank you, Director Brown. Thank you. I'm in and out here. Sorry. Um, I wanted to talk about. Um, Reference number 11 and recommendation four, where it talked about a three strike warning. Um, to me, this three strike warning says you can do it three times and, and then we will take your reimbursement away. I would like to say if you, if you ever put uh, an expense in that doesn't meet the requirements, it does not get paid. It goes back to the individual and perhaps a notice on file. Um, a second and third time should also be notices on file to be able to look at progressive discipline. If somebody does not comply with our rules, we've got it documented and out they go. Um, Mr. Hildebrand. Uh, thank you for that comment, Mayor Brown. Um, it's something that mistakes happen um, and that's how we're looking at this one. If there is omission of something or if there's a, an honest mistake, that's understandable. But if it continues to happen is where we need to get into a more uh, progressive discipline stance, but uh, well, point well taken, and that's our intention. And uh, it has to be noted in the file uh, in order to have your first, second, and third. Uh, it has to be documented in the HR. That's all I'm saying. Thanks. Thank you, Director Stamer. You had a little wee question, I, I heard. Yes, I did, and thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I really don't know if this is a place for us to be hashing over a bunch of the policies and that sort of thing, because it seems like we've got a fairly extensive agenda and these meetings are getting longer and longer. But there's one that just quickly popped out to me and it just, again, it's just something that it's not a big deal, but I think it's important. Uh, policies and bylaws number six, weak or lack of policies and bylaws risk that without adequate guidelines deviate. Number one, itemized receipt should be required for reimbursement. That should say must, must be required for reimbursement. I mean, in our district, uh, there isn't a receipt for anything, even for five bucks, it doesn't get paid. So I know it's not a big deal, but I just think that right off the bat, if you don't have a receipt for something, it doesn't get paid. So I know I don't want to get nitpicky about it, but just stuff like that, I think, is we have a, be a better opportunity, a different meeting to be able to discuss these. And Director Brown brought up an excellent point. If I understand the situation correctly, we're dealing with recommendations, which say itemized receipts should be presented. And I'm, I'm confident that when the policy is implemented, the policy will be that, I, that uh, itemized receipts must be submitted. But these are recommendations. Uh, okay, I think that's it in terms, of, in terms of people who wish to ask questions on this particular matter. Uh, we have a recommendation moved and seconded. All in favor? Is anyone opposed? I see no one opposed that's carried. Director Brown has still up to my people. Uh, anything's possible there. Uh, Director okay. Brown, can you take the hand off your screen? Can you remove the hand, hand from your screen? Thank you. Uh, okay, 1113. 
Uh, amended board and committee meeting schedule. There's a recommendation. Any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried uh, 1114 Logan Lake Landfill Crown Tenure. There is a recommendation. Second. Moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Or Robin, I don't see her. No, I don't. She, she's not raising her paw, so that's it. Uh, no discussion. All in favor? Anyone opposed? That's carried. Uh, 11, 1. 5. Uh, recommend the, the uh, I'm sorry, the committee appointments. There's a report from the general manager of corporate and legislative services. I, I don't think it needs to be moved, does it, uh, Ms. Campbell? Thank you, Chair. No, just, just for information, um, we'll leave it to you to um, to reappoint as you've uh, as, you, as you've indicated that you would like to do uh, the current directors to all the internal committees. And then we do require um, going through the appointment process by the board for our external um, committees. And, and I do in the report, you'll see that there are some directors that have expressed their interest in those external committees. In those external committees? Yeah. Okay, could you, uh, do we have do we have to go through a nomination process, Ms. Campbell, or? Yeah. Let's start with, we could start with Fraser Basin Council. Um, my understanding is that Director Rice is interested in being appointed to that committee again, so someone would need to make a motion to appoint him to that committee. I'll sorry? Move, I'll move that recommendation. That's moved. Yeah, that's a chair. Oh, sorry, that's, moved and that's seconded the one that chair. Director Rice. Oh, sorry, that's Chair Gillis. That's, uh, thank you. I did this last year too, Director Singh. That's a chair appointed committee, so you would appoint, uh, you would appoint the directors to the Fraser Basin Council. <laughs> So Director Rice has expressed his interest in the Fraser Basin Council and Director Schaefer has um, expressed her interest in being an alternate. On okay, the Fraser Basin I, Council. I remember now that is yeah. a that is a chair appointment. That's right. Okay, so. and I do hereby appoint okay. Director Rice uh, to the Fraser Basin Council and uh, Director Schaefer as alternate. So now, now uh, are there any others? So nope, just for the external committees appointments by the board. Uh, we have the Municipal Finance Authority. Director O'Reilly has expressed his interest in being appointed to that board. To MFA? Yes. I'd move that. Yep. So Director Singh's moved I'll it. second that. So those are not chair appointments. They have to be, okay, moved and seconded that uh, Director O'Reilly be appointed to the Municipal Finance Authority as our representative. Any, any further nominations? Mr. Kyle, so just add that motion to Brown be alternate. That's also on the list here. Can we do that all at once, sure. Ms. Campbell? Sure. I'll okay. Uh, any further discussion on that? All in favor? Anyone opposed? Good. That's dealt with. Uh, well, that's it, isn't it, uh, Ms. Campbell? Just no, the two we have of them? Three more. So we have the more. Municipal Insurance Association. I don't know if Director. Duties interested in being appointed again? Uh, did you wish to be reappointed, <laughs> Director Duty? Well, it's such hard work. I mean, I go to so many meetings and I have so much to report all the time. So I don't know whether I can handle it. I'll make a motion to uh, have Director Duty and Director Roden as alternate for Municipal Insurance Association. <laughs> all in favor? Anyone opposed? Carried. And the next one? We have the Shushwap Watershed Council and Director Christian and Director Crow have expressed their interest in being reappointed. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Carried. And if there's one more. There is. Sure. This way. Director Singh. Well, I just, I, it's community energy association. I'd like to move that uh, Director Blackwell be the director, Director Schaefer be the alternate uh, on the um, list. That's okay. Second. Oh, seconded. Any discussion? Quick before Director Blackwell realizes. Yeah, what all doing. in favor. <laughs> before Blackwell realizes what we've done to him. Yeah, I, I am. Great. I am more than willing to go back on that. Sorry, uh, in the <laughs> shuffle of things, I missed the uh, the appointment schedule and, and and haven't had any real committees since my cancer diagnosis last year. So anything you got that's spare that needs work, throw it at me. 
Thanks, Director Blackwell. Um, that's I'll give it, you a call, off, Ms. Campbell. Okay, that that attends to the to that and uh, uh, NDIT internship grant application. There is a rec there are two recommendations. Any discussion? All in favor? Oh, Watson. sorry, Director Watson. Because this is funded uh, by NDIT and Area E and Area I are the only um, areas uh, that are in the NDIT, um, does that mean this person will only work for us? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. okay, that's what I, I thought. thought. <laughs> okay. Any further discussion? All in favor? Anyone opposed? It's carried. Thank you. <laughs> Moved, Director, seconded. Director Quinn. Director Quinn, discussion? None of us on Zoom can hear any of that. It's a reminder to use your mics, directors. Ms. Campbell? Sorry, I just asked where the contribution of $21,060 is coming from, from the board. Is that coming just from area E and I, or is it all of us? That would Staff. come from general administration. Okay, thanks. Okay, any further discussion? All in favor? Opposed, if any? Carried? Uh, building permit activity report. Move for information. Any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Uh, that takes us to closed meeting matters brought forward to open. There's nothing coming, I think, Ms. Campbell. And uh, then committees. I want to speak for a minute or two about committees because we go through this um, ritual every, every meeting of uh, asking each chair for the uh, you know report on the committees and nine times out of 10, it's uh, no meeting, no report. So I think probably after today's meeting, uh, we will try to ascertain which committees have had meetings and just deal with them on that, on that basis rather than going through every single committee. Yeah. Because Director it's nice. Davey is gutted in on this announcement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Director Watson. I actually don't think that's a good idea because um, I think that being reminded of who's on these committees might be pertinent. Uh, some of us, and for, for years, uh, the policy review committee didn't even meet. Uh, it's a good reminder that some of these, uh, who's on what committee and what we should be doing. Director Roden. Uh, thank you, Chair Gillis. I have been through this in a couple of other communities within the TNRD that I know of, and uh, we stopped doing this in Ashcroft um, because no meeting, no report, no meeting, no report, no meeting, no report. All it did was lead, lead to questions of, well, what are you actually doing? And, and well, if, if committees only meet twice a year, then it stands to reason that out of 18 meetings in a year, there's going to be 16 where there's no meeting, no report. And I don't know that that conveys quite the picture that we want it to of industriousness within the TNRD. So that's just my, my counter view on the, uh, the litany of no meeting, no reports that we go through every meeting. Thanks, Director Roden. So that uh, takes us to internal committees, audit committee, Director Rain. Uh, uh, next meeting is in February, uh, no report. Thank you. Uh, Economic Development, uh, Director Roden. No meeting, no report. Electoral Area Directors, Director Kershaw. No meeting, no report. Emergency Management Protective Services, Director Watson. I look forward to having a productive meeting soon. Policy Review Committee, Director Sinclair. Our last meeting was in September and our next meeting is tomorrow. 
Thank you. Uh, Regional Solid Waste Management Director Schaefer. Uh, Thompson Nickel Invasive Plant, uh, Director Kershaw. Next meeting in March. Thompson Nickel uh, Regional Hospital District, Director Christian. Next meeting is in March. Uh, Utility Systems, Director Elliott. Thompson Headwaters, Director Quinn. No meeting, no report. Thank you. Uh, Wells Gray Country Services, Director Schaefer. Thank you. And Joint Services Committee, Director Schaefer. I'd like to receive the minutes of November the 8th for information. Yeah. All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. External Committees, Fraser Basin Council, Director Rice. Uh, thank you, Chair. I had a couple of meetings last week, including the operations meeting, which uh, we discussed uh, uh, quite a bit about lit and I'll just leave it short, but there's a lot going on there. Uh, we were had not quite signed, but we're in the process of signing. It may be signed by now, actually, the long-term contract for the facilitation of the rebuild between Fraser Basin and the province. So that is something that uh, is, is uh, probably done or close to being done. On, on that note, we have no accommodations left in Spence's Bridge because the numbers of working crews here, not only for the roads, but for the railroad tracks, which was compromised. Uh, and so they've got a full crew in there for the main crossing on Highway 8 for the uh, CN and CP. And then we just got a call from the TELUS team moving in to uh, restore the TELUS communications in Lytton, 14 strong and no place to put them. So uh, accommodations has become a huge issue uh, in uh, uh, the last guy on the crew that I met before mentioned is staying in Logan Lake and uh, Cash Creek and Ashcroft are virtually full and Spencer's Ridge is completely full. So, uh, I mean, it, it sounds like a good problem to have, but it's turned into a problem. Let's put it that way. And, uh, and that's about it. And I'd like to uh, move to receive the uh, minutes of the November 9th, uh, 2021 meeting. Moved and seconded, any discussion? All in favor? Opposed, if any? That's carried. Uh, thank you, Director Rice. Municipal Finance Authority, Director Brown. Uh, no meeting, no report. Our next meeting is on uh, March, uh, I don't know, 20, whatever it is. And Director O'Reilly will be the new um, representative and he's available to go to the meeting. So I'm really pleased with that. Thanks very much. Uh, <clears throat> MIA, Director Duty. Next meeting's in September. <laughs> How do you stab the pace? <clears throat> Shushko Up Watershed Council, Director Crow. No meeting, no report. Uh, Calus Airport Authority, Director Roden. No meeting, no report. And FCM, Director Singh. Uh, next meeting in March, I guess. Thank you. Uh, Community Energy, Director Blackwell. No meeting, no report. Thank you. We have correspondence uh, action requested. The TELUS wishes a letter of support for connecting <coughs> British Columbia program or, to improve uh, Nicola Lake connectivity. There's not a recommendation, but there's action requested. A letter of support. Any? Uh, it's moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Saying none, all in favor? Carried. Uh, District of Lillooet would like some support for a petition calling for changes in forest management and wildfire prevention practices. I'll second it. Move, Can seconded. we use mics, please? Is there any discussion? Oh, sorry. Director Elliott, could you make that motion? Would you put your mic on, please, and make it again? Because people on, they can't hear it. People on Zoom. I move we um, support the petition from Lillooet. And that was seconded by Director Stamer? Yes. Correct. OK, All any discussion? All in favor? Is anyone opposed? Carried. Uh, Thompson Nicola Conservation Initiative, the request for a letter of support for a funding application uh, 
for smart climate solutions. Move a letter. Move the letter. Moved, seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Is anyone opposed? Carried. Information only. We have a letter from Ms. Scarf, the safety officer at uh, Volunteer, Vavenby Volunteer Fire Department. Uh, and that's the only one. Can we have a motion to receive that? Okay. Moved, seconded, all in favor? Opposed, if any? None? Okay, that's carried. And now we have new business from members. Uh, there are hands up. I have you down for a notice of motion, Director Schaefer. Is that what you were going to speak about? This is something else? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so, Director Stamer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a couple of quick ones. I don't want to get too revved up. Uh, number one, I mean, we're all aware of what's going on with interior health and <clears throat> what's happening with our healthcare services. And, you know, just to bring it up to speed, they've had some significant um, uh, people that have got sick. So that's obviously affecting their, uh, their ability to maintain our healthcare services. But having said that, I was wondering if we could have a letter to Interior Health just to able to remind them that, you know, there's been a whole lot of lack of communication and professionalism and respect. And now we're going to get a lack of trust just because they're not being honest with us and they're not basically trying to communicate with us. They're sort of telling us what to do instead of really giving us an opportunity to have that discussion with them, even if it has to be at the same time as bad news is coming or whatever. They could do it a whole lot different than they are and, and that would be a suggestion and maybe changing their protocols when it comes to PSA public service announcements and that sort of thing. And uh, the second thing is, is uh, so I'd like, I'd like, you know, something to that effect and whether uh, directors uh, Blackwell and Roden want to talk about that because I think we should get their attention as much as that, you know, this is an evolving situation and some of these services that are being scaled back may come back quicker, they may go longer, but I think we wanna have open dialogue with Interior Health so that we do have, try to get that level of trust back because right now the doctors are steaming mad, the residents are steaming mad, and really we could have really done a whole lot better in being able to communicate not only to them, but our, but our residents on what's going on. So I'd like you know some input on that. And the second thing is back in November, we looked at that at the hospital board. We we uh, talked about and they showed us a provisional budget, and originally they were going to replace the MRI uh, at Royal Inland Hospital for 7.6 million, and then there was a recommendation to us for repairing that machine uh, for 2.2. I asked the question, why? You know, what is the rationale behind it? They said they would get back to us. They haven't. I've uh, I've talked to the chair. I've I've tried to get a couple of answers through Interior Health, and they haven't. Uh, really given me a very definitive answer on why we would not replace the most important piece of equipment that we have in the hospital. And also knowing that, you know, we're probably going to get some additional tax base if uh, Sun Rivers comes on board. So maybe there's some flexibilities in our budget. So I'm just wondering if we can put that on the agenda for March at the earliest with the hospital board that we have that discussion and have some answers around why they would want to defer uh, replacing that machine and would rather uh, repair it. Well, dealing with the uh, last question first, uh, is there any reason that cannot be put on the agenda for March? Uh, Director Christian. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you to Director Stamer. Uh, yeah, I made a note that the uh, deferral of the MRI machine will be on there. I think we'll have to have their medical imaging people come instead of the normal people, but that will be uh, on our agenda. And the taxation issue, I believe that uh, Mr. Ray and uh, myself have a meeting with uh, the uh, TTS in the coming weeks with respect to that. So there would be a follow-up report at the next uh, hospital district meeting in March. Thanks, Director Christian. Um, with the, uh, okay, uh, Director Polderman. Uh, two years ago, we put a, we approved a small equipment uh, purchases and as far as I know, the small equipment in Lytton never showed up. Hello, and since house. there is no hospital, there, I'd like to know what happened to the funding. <laughs> Director Christian. 
Yeah, uh, thank you. That, that, that's a good question. And I, I would suggest even a broader question would be, what is the strategy for the replacement of the Lytton healthcare facility? And I'll ask them specifically to address that in March. Director Rothenberger. Just a question. Uh, I, I believe uh, it was at our last meeting, some reference was made to a possible policy coming forth on a vaccination mandate for directors, uh, for the board of directors. Can you enlighten me as to whether that's uh, coming forward? I think that's the subject matter of uh, Director Schaefer's notice of motion, which is coming next on the agenda. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, Director Rice. Hey, thank you, the dogs are going crazy. I was gonna let them in, no, I won't. Um, anyways, just a couple of things I wanna note real quick. First of all, it's been an incredible adventure. So I gotta really shout out to Deanna and Scott who have been you know, there, but uh, really a huge shout out to Jamie, who's been a rock star. Um, communications, uh been not only incredible but off the clock communications you know when he's still you know taking calls and trying to make things happen as of and then as of today um I, something i've been working really hard on for about a month it's been two months november 15th keep that in mind over two months since uh, we didn't have a place to call home and the mental health issue has been weighing heavy heavily on 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 many of us here in spencer's bridge especially the evacuees and uh i got a call from this morning uh, this morning from Marcy at Gold Country, and once again, sort of partnering, had a really good call with Jamie and his team uh, yesterday with Interior Health, and got some real progress going on. It looks like mental health uh, support is going to actually come to Spencer's Bridge, possibly Monday and Tuesday next week uh, to be uh, determined, but, uh, and I also got a call from uh, Interior Health and uh, from a gentleman in a little wet named Greg, and uh, He's got us, I mean, connected with Deborah Jordan, a uh, mental health worker out of Ashcroft. And she's agreed to take on, um, you know, anything as far as in, in house appointments and over the phone appointments all next week. So some real progress on mental health. It seems like it's been a long road, but everything came together at one time. So I'm really excited to help. And in the fact that Gold Country has been with us through the whole thing, through the resiliency centers that they set up bringing folks down to Spencer's Bridge, Marcy yourself coming down here. I'd just like to uh, make a motion to a, a letter of thanks to Gold Country for, you know, partnering with the Thompson Nicola Regional District and uh, getting us through these uh, uh, wildfire and flood uh, crises. I'll second that. That's moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Any opposed? No one's opposed, that's carried. Uh, I have Director Schaefer and Director Singh, I think, re remaining on this. Sorry? Oh, okay. Director Schaefer. Yeah, I would just like to talk uh, that on December the 26th in Upper Clearwater Wells Great Park area, the landlines went down and they were down for well over a week due to the weather. And uh, in early January, it, it was due to the weather where the weather was so cold that the copper lines were breaking. So they'd fix it and then they'd break down, then they'd fix it and they'd break down. But um, they have updated it so that the telephones are now back in service. And from my understanding, TELUS will be revisiting later to do more updates, which are required because the lines are so old. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Director Singh. Thank you, Chuck. I may have missed something, but Director Stamer was asking about a, a letter to the uh, to the Interior Health about communication. Yeah. I'd be happy to second that if that's if that's appropriate. Yeah, I was going to I, I was going to get through all these comments and go to back to Director uh, okay. Stamer and ask him if he want wish to put that in the form of a motion. Sure, I just want to make sure. Thanks. Great. So, Director Stamer, you're moving that a letter be yes a uh, letter be sent to Interior Health. Uh, with respect to their communication practices. Is that correct? Absolutely. And going forward, you know, going forward, I think it's important for all of us in the region, you know, th things change and we just want to make sure that we don't want to hear the news in the newspaper. We'd like to be part of the process 
and also part of the solution if things are, are things are occurring and we can ask the questions and we we can do things instead of what we're doing now trying to play catch up and then it also puts a lot less pressure on interior health when the senior managers are contacting us and apologizing for apologizing profusely because they were ordered not to say anything or you know things like that i think it's totally unprofessional and it shows a, a level of disrespect to all of, all of us in this region and particularly to the healthcare professionals that we rely on on a daily basis to do what they can for our health. Thank you. Thank you. Seconded by Director Singh. Is there any discussion? Uh, Director Blackwell to start with, and I think Director Rain had his hand up. Yeah, Rick. thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. To um, Mayor, or, sorry, Director Stamer, if you notice in your inbox during the course of this meeting, there's a letter from the Mayor of the Village of New Denver, Leonard Casley, inviting um, Mayors that are directly affected by the, um, the the announcements of the last couple of days for a Zoom call to strategize exactly on what we're talking about, um, communication and a response, obviously. Um, I have deep sympathy for what the staff and even the management staff uh, of Interior Health have been going through for the last two years. But it, one f falling down point throughout the last two years has been communication. And, and I, I think it almost needs to be taken to the provincial level to ask that the communication department of interior health be doubled, tripled, bolstered, however, to improve communication to communities like ours and to the public. I have current active anti-vaxxer meetings and stuff happening in my town. And it's the constant fight of having to put out information myself as a community leader as the pointy end of the stick that is causing friction and division in our towns and the lack of clear information. It would be fantastic if we could have solid, proper communication from Interior Health, and I would support any effort to have that conversation all the way to the Premier's office. Thanks very much, Director Rain. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just uh, a bit confused. Are, are, we, are we talking about communication or the actual message uh, with the shutdowns and those things? Because it seems to me every two weeks there's a, a, a mayor's meeting with IHA. Uh, there was a special meeting just the other day uh, where they certainly announced all of these changes ahead of the fact. Now, they didn't go into the communities where the changes were being proposed and have some discussion and collaboration in terms of what would be cut in the hours and those, those things. But I'm just, I mean, I, I've thought they've tried to communicate. Maybe we don't like the, the message they're sending, uh, but it, uh, I just want to make sure we're not criticizing them for lack of communication and then they're, they're going to come back and say, well, every two weeks we, we we have a meeting and we have all the mayors in attendance and some mayors aren't in attendance at those meetings, uh, but they do call them. Uh, thank you, Director Blackwell. Did you wish to respond? Is there, your hand is still up. Sorry, pushing the wrong button. Um, through you, Chair, to Director Rain. Um, to the point on communication on this one, I was in a Zoom call with basically everybody at Interior Health that would know that these decisions were... Can you turn your volume up, Director Blackwell? Oh, sorry. I'll, turn, I'll, I'll bring my mic down into thing here. So um, to, to Director Rain, uh, through the chair, uh, I was in a Zoom call from 11 to 30 to 12 30, the day of those announcements, which was yesterday. Life just seems to go at an exponential pace and time drags on. Um, with all the people from Interior Health, with the exception of uh, Susan Brown, who would be aware of these decisions, um, that announcement came out a half an hour later. Um, through the press, we were completely blindsided by that. There was no consultation in a meeting a half an hour before this, even though we do know, and they have apologized that they did know but could not say anything, um, that this was coming down. Um, even a heads up, I need to talk to you in a half an hour. 
would have changed the dynamic of this. For me, that's part of it. But messaging, you know, as a person that wrote and communicated for a living has also not been effective during this thing. So it's both. Thank you. Okay. Uh, if Director I may, uh, I, sorry, if I may just follow up to, uh, on that. Yeah. Okay, were, were you not invited? Were you not invited to the the meeting with uh, Minister Dix, Susan Brown? I believe I'm thinking it was yesterday. Uh, uh, I forgot what time now. Yes, but there but was the, a, to answer I your question. To answer your question, Director Rain. Um, Yes, an invitation went out for staff, but the announcement actually came out in the news before the meeting occurred. Director Roden. Yes, uh, timeline was 1018 on Tuesday morning. We all received an invitation to a meeting. There was no indication of what specifically it was about. The meeting was to start at three o'clock on Tuesday, the 18th. The actual press release announcing that the reductions and closures would be happening and where came out a few minutes before that three o'clock meeting was due to start. So um, I received it in my press capacity. I did not receive the notice in my mayoral capacity. So I found out as a journalist before the meeting that I was supposed to be at as mayor was due to start. Um, at that, uh, I do not know what happened at that meeting. Um, the next, uh, so that was three, just before three o'clock Tuesday, the initial press release came out. Subsequently, I found out that yes, Interior Health did know that this was in the pike and uh, at least one senior official had asked if she could at least please give her mayors a heads up on the QT. She was told no, no, not one word is to go out about this. The actual press release that came out just before three o'clock on Tuesday was not helpful in details to the point where at uh, 927 this morning, day and a half later, Interior Health actually issued another press release saying what exactly these closures and reductions at barrier would look like. So that's 36 hours where people in that community are wondering what the heck is going on because this press release tells us absolutely nothing except that our healthcare services are in jeopardy here. So failure to communicate with mayors, failure to communicate in a timely manner, failure to communicate when they actually communicate and that they don't give you actually any useful information to the point where 36 hours later they have to clarify what they were communicating about in the first place. Thank you, uh, Director Bass. Thank you. I think one of the issues here is that senior management controls what messages we get. I've learned more from nurses, other healthcare workers, and doctors in the last seven weeks about what's going on at the hospital, what equipment's not working, what nurses are, are not are being pulled into areas that they are have no expertise in, about patients having how about code blues happening and them having to grab nurses from other departments because there aren't enough nurses? I've learned more of that from the staff than I have from anyone else. And we have asked through um, city council, we have asked for that information for a long time. So I think the problem starts at the top here with Susan Brown. Um, I've had staff there say they're terrified to say anything because they're afraid they'll be fired. There was apparently a bet going on when one of the doctors did go public that he would lose his job. That's how they that's how bad it is there. So it's not a lack of communication and another 10 or 15 communication officers aren't going to change the fact that they just don't want to tell us anything. Thank you, Director Rice. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And not to pile on, but I'm going to pile on. Um, you know, when you're when you're here and you're already struggling with your emergency and thank God for uh, Director Roden, because with her social media savvy and, and, and willingness to, to, to notify people on social media and then also in the journal, we wouldn't have any clue. But we've been seeing some, you know, close, emergency closures. And the first I ever heard of any of this talk about messaging, us lowly directors, unless we have a Barbara Road that we sort of follow, 
we find it on this. So I get up this morning and see Ashcroft and Lillooet on the news and what's going on there and stuff like that. And keep in mind, these people are already hurting because we've, as, as Director Roden can tell you, we've had some really tough times with our hospital as it has been with, and then eliminated Linton with no prescriptions and all that entails. It is, we need to get the messaging to the right people. A simple, in, in, uh, you got a great conduit for our Ashcroft and Linton folks through Barbara um, because she gets the message out. If she just had a heads up and knowing this a day in advance instead of on the news next morning would go a long way. So that's my little rant for the messaging. It does need some work. Hey, thank you, Director Steamer is the last one. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate the support and to Director Rain. I did not receive an invite to the mayors, neither did any of our staff. I found out from Mayor Millibar, or from MLA Millibar that this meeting was even occurring. And when I brought that up on CBC yesterday morning to the fact that I thought it was very disrespectful that I didn't even get the heads up, uh, Susan Brown's reply was, well, it's unfortunate that he wasn't able to be on the meeting, but uh, he got the same information as everybody else did. Really? That's how you're going to build relationships is, is doing this kind of stuff? It's absolutely ridiculous. And it's unfortunate that's what it's, it's come to. But, you know, right now, I'll give you a, a perfect example of what could occur with a lack of communication is after talking to Mayor Blackwell this morning and knowing that I, the way I feel with our emergency services and barrier is very rarely we go to Clearwater because obviously there's way more uh, opportunities for specialists and care in Kamloops. And of course, even with, with the, the distance and the road conditions, it's quicker. Uh, having said that, the way it's set up right now, the way Interior Health has set it up, if one of our residents in Barrier happens to go to the emergency uh, department in Clearwater, they're probably going to get uh, transferred to 100 miles. So imagine somebody that's uh, low income or a senior, they, they somehow get to Clearwater, even if the ambulance sends them to Clearwater, then sends them to 100 miles, and then all of a sudden, for whatever reason, they're able to discharge them, then what? How do we even get them back home? I mean, it's a whole lot easier to say, well, yes, unfortunately, our emergency services aren't going to be are, are going to be affected, but at least if we get them to Kamloops, we've got a whole lot better chance of getting them home. Interior Health isn't even helping us with that. That's how bad it is. Okay, so I think we've exhausted the discussion on the topic of that letter. I'm all in favor of sending the letter to Interior Health. Opposed, if any. I've seen, I've seen no one opposed. So <clears throat> that is carried. We're still on new business, uh, Director Schaefer. I'd just like to know if we could, instead of just sending it to RIH or, or to the Interior Health, can we send it directly to the Board of Directors as well of the IHA? Uh, <clears throat> I, don't, I don't have the answer to that question. I, I would expect it would go uh, directly to the senior management at Interior Health, but perhaps- we, uh, Mr. Chair, can we CC it to the ministry too? Sorry? Can we CC that letter to the ministry as well? I would hope so, yes. Uh, Director Christian, thank you. Uh, thank you, that, that's a good point. I mean, these are operational issues uh, related to communication and staffing. Uh, so these are the responsibility of the Interior Health Board. Uh, Dr. Doug Cochran is the chair of the board, uh, and Susan is the president and CEO. I would suggest sending it both to Dr. Cochran and to Sue, Susan, as well as to the Minister of Health. Thank you. Is that satisfactory? <laughs> Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you, Mr. Does chair. That answer your question, Director Schaefer. Okay, did you have one, Director Watson? Yes, I uh, would advise us to send every bit of mail that we have to the board of directors of wherever we're sending it to, because if it just goes to the chair, it could get shredded. There you go. Uh, that's okay, Director Laird. Um, Director Kershaw, you had new business. Yes, this is completely on another subject. Uh, I would like to appoint for our, our APC, I'd like to reappoint Kathy Dana and Harley Wright. I'll second that. Any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. Uh, that takes us to notice a motion from Director Schaefer. 
Hi, um, I'll just read this out. It's concerning vaccines for the board. It says, whereas the ongoing spread of COVID-19 and its variants pose a threat to the health and safety of TNRD employees, board members, their families and the communities we serve. And whereas the TNRD board is committed to the health, safety and well-being of the TNRD employees, fellow board members, their families and the communities we serve. And whereas the COVID-19 vaccine continues to reduce a person's risk of, con of con contracting the virus, preventing hospitalization and death. And whereas the Public Health Agency of Canada has stated that vaccine is a leading public health prevention strategy to end the COVID-19 pandemic. And whereas the TNRD has implemented a mandatory vaccine policy for staff, volunteers and contractors. Therefore, it be resolved that board members entering the TNRD workplace and attending TNRD work board meetings in person must be fully vaccinated. Members who are not fully vaccinated may participate virtually in accordance with the board procedure bylaw number 2723. That will, that will simply be coming forward as a notice of motion at the next meeting, am I correct? That right, uh, Ms. Campbell? Correct. It'll be on the next agenda for debate and discussion. Thank you. Director Laird. <coughs> Mr. Chair, I apologize for my outburst. Thank um, you. I do not appreciate the way uh, <coughs> Director Watson treats the board with her sarcastic remarks and innuendo. It's nothing to do, what you say has nothing to do with board business. You're being vindictive That's, it's... and nasty. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Noted. I think, I hope, that takes us to question period. There aren't any questions known in the gallery. Director Watson. I uh, don't think what I said was sarcastic. I think that if policies don't, aren't in place for mail to get to the board of directors, if they just go to the chair, they don't go to the board of directors. Maybe it depends on who they were addressed to. And that might have something to do with it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna cease any further discussion on this. I, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Thank you for your patience. We're adjourned.